less than the last few people. You just get yourselves comfortable. So welcome everyone to the Industrial Energy Transformation Fund Technology Showcase. My name is Jenny McDonnell from Innovate UK's KTN and I'm hosting today's event on behalf of the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Supported by my colleagues today, I have Ray Chegrin and Lucinda Badger and also you will have met Olivia Brown when you came in who uh, did your name badge for you as well. So if you need any help at all today, come and find one of us for and we'll do our best to help you. So before we get started um, with the main event, just to run through a little bit of housekeeping. We're obviously, well, I say obviously, it's the winter. Um, we're in COVID or flu season or bug season. So just to remind everybody, keep washing your hands, using the hand sanitizers that are available at the venue, um, just so that we can carry on normal life and shake hands in the normal way. If you'd like to wear a face mask today, that's absolutely fine. You don't have to, but if it makes you feel more comfortable, then, then please do wear a mask. All of our refreshments today, so the drinks and uh, lunch as well, will be served out in the main area we've just been in. We've got the whole of this area for the whole day, so do feel free to go out there if you want to do a bit of networking, um, and all the refreshments will be out there too. If you haven't found them already, the uh, toilets, ladies and gents, is out of this door and right, and it's tucked away in the corner, just on the right-hand side. And that's also the same way that you go to if there's a fire alarm. So we don't have any tests booked for today, so if the alarm goes off, it will be a, a real thing. There is an exit there as well, but if you go follow the sign to the toilet for some reason, that also takes you out to the fire exit and will congregate at the front of the building on the opposite side of the road um, by the museum. Um, that's toilets. Uh, in terms of networking, today is all about networking. That's why we're having this face-to-face -face event. Um, we want you to try and do as much networking as you can. So the first activity that we've got lined up for you is at the end of the event, uh, so we're hoping to finish about three o'clock, we have some of the industrial sites that are here with us today have agreed to do one-to-one -one chats with you. So if you'd like to sign up for a 10-minute chat with one of those industrial sites, there is a sign-up sheet on the welcome desk, and you can just pop your name in there. And we are restricting it to one person, one industrial site, so you can't book slots across all of the industrial sites just to give everybody a chance to talk to them. And, and I will list who those people are, who the industrial sites are, when we get to that part of uh, the event, where you could go and sign up at the break. The second thing that we have to help you with networking is a digital networking wall. So again, everything's by the toilets. Um, as you come out the door here, turn right, there's a big screen on the wall there. At the minute, it's got Baze's logo on it. At the break and at lunchtime, the networking wall will be scrolling. So last week, Olivia sent you an email saying if you wanted to fill in a uh, networking template, she sent you a slide. You could pop in information about who you are, what you have to offer those slides will be scrolling on this networking wall. So if you're looking for particular partners or support of any kind, you will see it on the networking wall. If you didn't get a chance to fill in your template, but you would like to be added to the networking wall, there's still a chance to do that. So if, if you get in touch with Olivia on the welcome desk, she can send you that slide template, you can fill it in, email it back to her, and you go straight onto the wall. So we will share the networking wall as well after the event so that you can find partners that way too. As well as networking people, on the networking wall, you'll also see scrolling around the agenda. So if you lose track of where we are on the day, every fifth slide, I think, will be the agenda. And you'll also see a lot of information about support that's available for you in relation to the IETF competitions that you're going to hear about this morning. Um, lastly, the, we are recording today's event, so you will have seen all the cameras at the back of the room. Um, you will get a link to the recording after the event, so you can watch again and share with colleagues. But could I ask you to try not to walk in front of the cameras? They are right at the back, so we shouldn't. You shouldn't do. But when the sessions are running, try to not walk in front of the cameras um, so that we don't interrupt any of the presentations. And if you could pop your phones, if you haven't already, onto silent, again, so that we don't have any unexpected interruptions during the presentations. In terms of the agenda for today, we have, first of all, 
a presentation from Bayes on the Industrial Energy Transformation Fund. The competitions are open right now, so they'll be talking you through the details of how to apply to that, but also talking about what we've achieved with the IETF. So it's been running since the summer 2020, um, and we've done very well with that. I shouldn't probably go on into any more detail, because I'll be stealing Lily's thunder. So she'll talk you through that. Um, we then have the first two of our four IETF funded projects. So they're going to be presenting some of the projects that were funded back in the spring of 2021 in phase one of IETF. And then you'll get a chance to ask any questions that you have of our speakers. After that, we're going to do a little networking activity just before we go into the break, just to warm you up, get you talking to people that you don't know. And Animesh is smiling because he's been to my events before, so he knows how much fun they are. Um, and then you'll get a chance to have a tea and coffee and, and carry on your networking. We'll then have our second two funded projects from the IETF programme, again talking about what they've achieved with the money that they've received and a, another Q&A session. Then we'll break for lunch. After the lunch, um, the minister is joining us. He's only going to be here for a short amount of time, unfortunately. Um, but Lord Callanan, who is the Minister for Business, Energy and Corporate Responsibility, will be coming hot-footed it from uh, Parliament to come and share his views about industrial energy efficiency, and you will get a chance to ask him some questions as well. And then the remainder of the afternoon then is a panel discussion about industrial energy efficiency, um, followed by another of Bayes' funds, the Industrial Heat Recovery Support Programme, um, which was another capital fund helping people to uh, do heat recovery on their industrial sites. And uh, they'll be sharing what they've achieved with that programme as well before we wrap up at three o'clock. So I hope you agree that's a, a very packed day, but hopefully a very useful day that will give you some ideas of what you can do with IETF funding as well. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to Lily Toza. She's head of uh, IETF capacity and policy, cap capacity building and policy at Bayes, and uh, to tell you a little bit more about the IETF. Over to you, Lily. Fab. Thanks very much, Jenny, and hi everyone. It's really nice to see some like new, spa new faces today, and also some familiar ones from all the projects that we've funded so far. Um, the whole point of today, as Jenny said, is to really talk about what we've done, what more is there to be done, and how do we kind of share some of the experiences that we've all gained from being part of the ITF or part of some of these other funds that are supporting you to uh, cut your emissions and cut your energy bills. I guess the bigger picture of why we're all here today is sort of presented in the challenge in this graph, which is that in order to meet net zero by 2050, we're going to need to do a lot within industry. So industrial emissions are gonna to have to fall by 90% compared to today's levels. And that's uh, going to be employing things like uh, resource efficiency measures, energy efficiency measures over the next 10 to 20 years, paving the way for us to bring in lower carbon fuels, even using carbon capture. And we recognise that for industry, this is a really specific challenge because a lot of the processes that you're employing are very specific to you. There's risk involved in some of these technologies. And we also want to make sure that you're remaining competitive as you're uh, investing. So. That's really why the ITF has been set up in the first place. We've got two objectives. The first of them, really important at the moment, is to reduce your energy costs. So helping you to deploy those technologies that are going to cut your energy bills now, and longer term, cut your emissions as well. We also want to bring down some of the costs and the risks associated with these technologies. So a lot of the people here in the room today are going to be first movers in deploying some of these technologies. That's going to help us to bring down the risks. It's going to help us all to learn lessons about what these technologies can do for the economy, how they can be deployed at scale. And the fund itself uh, is open to businesses registered in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. We've got no size restrictions on the type of organisation that can apply. So we're really hoping that we can support the whole of industry, wherever you might be, to sort of move along uh, on that net zero journey. There is a, uh, a fund in Scotland as well, so we're not forgetting any part of the UK. Um, there's a sister scheme called the Scottish IETF. It's very similar to what the IETF does, uh, and I'll drop a link to that later on in the, the presentation. In terms of who's eligible to apply, uh, when we're talking about industry, we're often thinking about sort of energy-intensive processes and activities that you might be doing. So this table here represents the, the different types of category of uh, site that are eligible to apply. 
to the fund as a uh, lead applicant. So you could be from the mining and quarrying sector, manufacturing, from sites that are recovering and recycling materials, or you might also be a data centre, recognising that that's obviously an incredibly energy intensive activity. When you apply to us, you just need to check that you fit within one of these categories of activity, and if you've got any concerns or questions about that, just come and chat to us and we'll, we'll let you know. The fund itself um, has been running for a little while, as Jenny said, so we've had um, five competition rounds already, which has been great, and we've seen some really good projects coming through. That means we've spent some of our £289 million budget, but there's still a significant amount that we've got to spend in this final window. So if you have any ideas, please do send them in in this final window. You've got until January the 13th to do that, which is a bit unfortunate because it's a Friday, but uh, hopefully that won't put you off. And if you've got any questions in the run-up to that closing date, again, please come and talk to us. We tend to get quite busy towards the end of the window, uh, but myself and team are here every step of the way if you've got any questions about how to get your, comp uh, your application in. The fund is split into three different uh, strands, as you can see here. So there's an energy efficiency deployment strand. So that's when you have a really good idea, you're relatively sure that it's going to work on your site and you just want to go ahead and make the investment in that equipment or any of the adaptations that you need on your site in order to deploy that. You can apply to the uh, energy efficiency deployment uh, strand of the competition. You'll get grant funding anywhere between 30 and 50% standardly uh, towards the costs of doing that. Um, and you can be up and running by 2025. The deep decarbonisation strand of the competition does exactly the same thing. It provides grant funding. The thresholds that you can get are slightly higher there. Um, so anywhere between 50 and 70% standardly against the costs of that equipment. Um, and all the way up to a grant of £30 million through the deep decarbonisation deployment competition. And then finally, if you're a little bit earlier on in the journey, so you've identified that perhaps there's a piece of technology out there that might be relevant for your uh, site, but you're not quite sure exactly what the costs, the benefits might be, then you can apply for a study. So that could be a feasibility study or an engineering study to help you to investigate whether it's worthwhile making an investment in that technology on your site. Um, when we talk about energy efficiency and decarbonisation, um, we have a really broad sort of definition of what those things might be. We're generally a technology neutral fund, so we kind of recognise that it's you yourselves that are going to know what the best sort of technology for your own process will be. So this slide just gives you an idea of the sorts of technologies that we expect to see coming through the fund and indeed have seen coming through the fund. So things like process optimisation, it might be installing energy management systems for example. Um, equipment upgrades, so replacing some of your older equipment with much more advanced uh, equipment. Process and energy uh, recovery and resource efficiency measures as well where they're going to help you to save energy within your process, perhaps through sort of more lean manufacturing and so on. On the deep decarbonisation strand, this is all about decarbonising the energy that you're using or reducing the direct emissions that you're producing. So that could include fuel switching technologies, uh, so investments in electrifying your equipment would all be in scope, as would retrofits or upgrades, perhaps to switch you to hydrogen or other low carbon fuels like biogas and biomass. There's a few different rules around this that I would direct you to in our guidance. You can also come and talk to us if you've got questions. Um, and lastly, there is carbon capture uh, as, as one of these technologies as well. In this competition round, we've expanded the scope a little to include non-road mobile machinery. Uh, so that's things like forklifts, cranes, all the stuff on your sites that might well be consuming a lot of energy, uh, producing a lot of emissions, difficult to decarbonise we can support you if you've got some ideas around how you might do that. They, so myself and different colleagues across the room, are all here today because we're running the fund. So through the application process and after you're successful and set your project up, it will be us that's working with you on your, uh, your project. We're ably supported by the KTN, so Jenny and team who are running loads of events like this and have some really great resources to help you network, find new solutions and projects and things like that. And I mentioned that the Scottish Government has their own site, uh, own competition as well. These are the key dates. Um, all of these are up online. I won't dwell on it too much. The main one is that 13th of January date that I mentioned before. After that, we'll work with you on a process of, sort of due diligence uh, and project setup, and then you can get going with your, comp uh, with your own project. 
And in terms of the successes, so um, this sort of heat map shows where all of the different projects that we funded to date are. Um, you'll see it's all across the country. There is some clustering around sort of, for example, Liverpool Bay Area, where we know there's some exciting things going on with HiNet. Um, but generally, we've seen a really big range of different kinds of sectors, uh, different organisation sizes applying. And you'll see a lot of the good uh, examples of that today through the presentations, and huge thanks to the speakers who've joined us today to talk about those. Um, you'll also see some of the case studies up on gov.uk as well. Um, so there's over 100 projects. We're sort of updating that government uh, web page as we get sort of further into those projects and can provide more details. Um, that's everything I've got to say. Uh, this is our contact address. Uh, it will be everywhere, so if you type in IETF online, you'll be able to find us. Uh, and I'll pass back to Jenny now. You're very good, Richard. Thank you for that. Um, so next up, we have the first of our IETF-funded projects. We have uh, Erin Bailey from CELSA. Erin is the UK Innovation Manager at CELSA, and he's going to talk about their deployment project where they change their shredder equipment to save energy. So over to you, Erin. Okay, um, thank you, and uh, thank you for uh, Bayes and, and uh, KTN for inviting me here today and by allowing us to <coughs> talk about our, our circle project. Um, yes, it is a shredder, <laughs> and it's it's. Um, but we, we're we're evolving a little bit from that. Firstly, I I would start with a, with a caveat. I'm I'm a specialist generalist, so in terms of technical knowledge, it's quite limited. So when we uh, when we get onto the project, if anyone has any questions. You can ask the question, I'll find the answer for you. Um, I need to start with, with um, providing some context to this project and, and why, we, why we did this, uh, why we, in, we invested time and effort into putting this application together. <coughs> uh, and this is about information about CELSA, about CELSA as an organisation and what we're doing, the direction we're going in and, and where the CERFA project fits in. So CELSA is... Um, <coughs> excuse me. CELSA, is, uh, CELSA has a vision. Uh, and the vision is to be leaders in circular supply chains and to build, to build a net positive future. I won't go through the values, but ultimately CELSA is, is effectively the UK's largest recycler. We recycle around about 1.2 million tonnes of scrap every year, um, and we produce products for the construction sector using electric arc furnace. So all of our, our um, processing of steel into, of scrap into, into steel products is done through our, our furnace. So the quality of going through that furnace is, is quite important to us. Uh, we source 100% of all our scrap in the, from the UK, and we supply uh, that material to the UK market. We, um, it's a family-owned business. It, it was established in the 1960s in, in Spain, and in the UK, I think we're here since 2003, they came to the UK to, to develop the, the process. And, and we work on lots of major projects. So one, one particular project is, is Hinkley, Hinkley Power Station. So that's, we supply all the steel for Hinkley. Um, <coughs> so with the processing of 1.2 million tonnes of scrap, we supply about a million tonnes of steel products to the construction sector. Um, we're, we're based in Cardiff, so the, the location is, is fairly well linked to most of the UK. And, and we effectively make our product in the UK to build the UK. That's the, the strap line. Our, our latest um, EPD is four... 428, which is four, 428 kilograms of CO2 per tonne of steel. And if you compare that to other EAF producers and other BOF producers of steel, it's quite significantly lower. So uh, up to 2.2, 2.7 tonnes of CO2 for some um, blast furnace producers. So it gives you a bit of context as to, as to why we're looking at energy and, and efficiency is important to us. So this is our... Our, our, uh, where we are located all over, over the UK, we are an integrated supply chain, so we have obviously the scrap processing capabilities, steel melting, um, steel rolling, and steel fabrication. So we, we'll, the, the brands you see, BRC, Express, ROM, and so on, they're, they're sites all over the UK, and they will supply the, 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 the finished product to the construction sites. Uh, and this is the process, where we collect the scrap, we put it through our electric arc furnace, we have a... Um, a ladle furnace which refines the, the molten steel and then we cast it into billets. Those billets then go to our two rolling mills. One is the, the rod and bar mill which produces rebar and wire and the other is a sections product 
um, which flats and, and, and angles actions. So I naively call it below ground and above ground applications. So <coughs> we, um, we realized when, when, you, when you assess where scrap comes from um, and, and where the products we produce go to, it's generally it's, it's to and from the same organizations in the construction sector. So we, just started, we started evolving the conversation around circularity and that if we in, in, introduce the concept of, of resource recovery to those construction companies, we can provide that closed loop service to, to the construction sector. So this is something we, we, we've been evolving over the last couple of years. We're trying to get the construction sector to realize if we can recycle their materials, we help them reduce their scope three emissions, both from waste in demolition and the newly procured material as well. So <coughs> it's, it's an evolving story. The construction sector are getting there eventually, but it's slow. We proved this concept through a, a pilot we did with BAM Construction on, on the Plaza Cinema in Port Talbot in South Wales, where the cinema was, it was a, an Art Deco building. The cinema was coming down, it had been derelict for years. Uh, they ke kept the, the front facade, the Art Deco facade, but they knocked down everything else. And we managed to get in touch with them, um, introduce their, their demolition team and their procurement team who had never met before. So they, uh, they sat together around the table and we, we, we sussed out that we can recover their material, process it through our, our, our factory, fabricate it into a product and then deliver back to that same site as, as new steel. <coughs> so we proved this as a concept, I would deliver this as a concept to be able to prove and all we really had to do is, is to make sure that Celsa's name was on the waste transfer note from the demolition site and this closed loop was able to fit into, into place. <coughs> um, Celsa has a net zero pathway and, um, and critical to that is our collaboration with the South Wales Industry Cluster. And I, I like the, the heat map earlier on. There's no surprise that the, uh, the heat map in South Wales is all, is all based around the cluster and the cluster collaborations and activities. <coughs> so it's, it's uh, important just to touch on that. Okay, the, um, the circle project. And the reason we, we, we needed to, um, to develop this project, <coughs> develop a shredder, um, on site at Salsa, we're going through the phases now, but it's 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 obviously key to to base that we're able to do this. Um, but it's to, it's, this is about developing the um, the capability to control and to have a, a, a lot more control about the quality of materials that we're putting through our furnace. <coughs> I'll go through a little bit about the the scrap sector in a little bit, just to give it again a bit more context. Um, but so what we're doing is is developing. A, a shredder on site at Cardiff, close to the, 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 the plant, um, and to, to look at the, the quality material and, and control the quality material that's going through our process. I've got a water here, Jim. Thanks. Um, we, we have some knowledge and understanding of, of shredder technology, which, we've, which we have um, in, in Barcelona. So we're taking a lot of that knowledge as well with us to help us develop the, the right sort of process. So we're, we're not we're not going at this completely blind, and and basically it's, it's about understanding how we can capitalise on, on the, the processing materials from the UK. Um, this is a very bad slide, but it just gives you an idea of, of the, the type of fractions we can get and the, qu the quality we can achieve from having a shredder on site, and, and therefore the, the, the quality of material being processed moves from a very, very perhaps a downcycling um, aspect to a higher level of quality. This is the, 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 the timelines, and we, we're happy to say we're on track with those. Again, I won't go into details there. And some of the benefits, the, the, the critical benefits of this is the, um, um, well, avoiding heating and melting unnecessary materials in, in, in the, the electric arc furnace. We want to melt st steel. We don't want to melt anything else. <coughs> and the, the less impurities we have in that, in that feedstock, the more efficient the process is going to be. And we can then reduce the... The, um, the, the wear and tear on, on the, the, the plant. So overall, the productivity and, and, and efficiency of the energy, the electricity we use, is, is targeted towards the right material, not, not material that we don't want to, to process. I'm gonna skip over this, this carbon uh, reduction bit because it talks about this, the scrap steel sector. Because I've got another slide which is a bit more detail and again gives you that context. Um, the, the improving, in, in our opinion, improving the resilience of CELSA improves the resilience 
of the construction supply chain um, because ultimately we're supplying a million tons of material into the construction sector and if we can be as efficient as we possibly can that means that the, the construction sector can be and um, and we're looking at the, the whole idea of, 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 of waste and the elimination of waste. Waste is, in my opinion, just bad design. And ultimately, we can design solutions to eliminate the concept of waste completely. Now, this is um, a piece taken from a, <coughs> a report published by um, the World Manufacturing Group by R Ross Hall. And this kind of looks into the steel sector <coughs> and the... Um, the material we produce in the UK, but the key figure here for me is the, the amount of material we export. This, this is scrap. <coughs> the UK produces around about 11 million tonnes every year, but we export 87% of that. All of that material goes, and it goes to Turkey, China, Russia, to produce steel, <coughs> and then gets imported back in as finished product. And ultimately what we're doing is we're, we're moving carbon around. And what we want to do is, is make sure we keep as much of the product we can in the UK and, and us being able to process the material ourselves gives us that control and allows us to, to keep that material circulating within the UK. <coughs> so to finish up, um, so the, the project has moved on quite nicely. We finalised the contracts with, with the chosen supplier, which is Lindemann, and some sub-suppliers um, in there as well. We've initiated the planning um, permission applications, we've gone through all the technical specifications and we, we've um, initiated the, the commercials on, on the, the civils as well. So it's because of this and, and, and it's, it's certainly an evolution for us in terms of Im improving and delivering circular solutions and, uh, and obviously it's thanks to UKRI and BASE for us to be able to, to do this. That's me. to see you struggle that's what right. <laughs> so thanks very much we'll be able to ask questions of Owen in a, a moment when we've heard from our second presenter so I'm hoping Ed lovely thank you <laughs> Ed was stuck on the train was an hour later than he thought he was going to be so really pleased to see you Ed um, so Ed is going to Ed's from uh, North Shore and he's been working with the Red Hill Data Centre and he's going to talk to you about their project um, looking at uh, improving the efficiency of their chillers over to you, Ed. My name's Ed Marks. I come from a company called um, North Shore. I'm here today to talk to um, a project which we are currently um, implementing on behalf of our client um, in the data centre sector, um, and it's an energy efficiency uh, deployment. So um, the things I'm going to touch on, first, a little bit of background about who North Shore are, um, and more, probably more importantly, who our clients are, um, and why the problems that we solve on their behalf um, is very, very important. Then I'll go into a little bit more about the, the project, um, the details of the project and the technology that we've deployed. Um, then a little bit about how we, we came to this solution, how we selected this, um, this project um, to move forward with the ITF application. Um, ultimately, how the ITF application uh, fitted in with the, um, the CapEx management cycle of our clients. Um, and then we can look a little bit about the applicability um, into other, other locations, not just data centres, but, but other industrial sites. So first, a um, bit of background on North Shore. So we were founded in 2020, um, ultimately um, with the aim of making the internet more sustainable. Uh, really what I mean by that is uh, our clients are the builders, owners, operators of data centres, which are the, uh, the physical infrastructure that sits behind um, the internet. It provides the power, the, the cooling, and ultimately the roof over the head um, of the IT equipment uh, which forms the internet. Um, it's um, becoming increasingly sort of present in, in the news that you know, how much energy and water that these facilities um, consume. Um, so we'll get onto that a little bit um, later on as well. Um, but ultimately we take a, a kind of a portfolio approach. So we, we deal with all of our, our clients' buildings um, we have a, a, well, a data-driven layer um, behind that, which essentially where we, we execute programs and work to bring data from all the buildings, um, do some analysis on that, and ultimately find the key areas um, within their portfolio and within the individual buildings of essentially where CapEx needs to go um, to meet their sustainability targets. 
And then the final layer of that um, is to um, support them in the implementation of those projects by trying to find ways to make the financials of those projects viable, which is where uh, the ITF fund has come in. So um, the project I'm going to talk to you today um, is, is for Digital Realty UK. Um, Digital Realty is probably up there with the top two biggest um, data centre operators uh, in the world. Um, they have uh, 14 locations um, here in the UK, but it's about um, 10 times that, probably a little bit more uh, globally. globally. Um, their business is to own, build, operate, retrofit buildings into data centres um, and then um, lease that space and infrastructure um, to, to companies that need um, to put their IT equipment somewhere. So, as I said a little bit earlier, that we kind of we deliver a, a, a full sustainability program um, on their behalf, which involves identifying energy efficiency projects and supporting with the implementation. So, uh, why is this important? Well, I mean, there is a lot of figures thrown around, and they can be quite variable um, in terms of uh, how much data, how much energy data centers use. Um, that can be because it's the definition of a data center can be quite difficult. It could be a great big 60 megawatt building in Arizona owned by Facebook, or it could be, sorry, Meta, or it could be um, uh, a broom cupboard in, um, uh, in a company's office which houses a couple of servers. But generally, when we talk about commercial data centers, buildings built and operated specifically for the purpose of housing IT equipment, there's about 400 to 600 um, known buildings in the UK. Um, and current estimates are that they, um, they, they use about 2.5% of, of the UK's total electricity consumption. So it's not insignificant at all. Uh, and also, um, the projections uh, only really sort of go upwards because most industries find themselves on this digital transformation path um, where IT is becoming ever, ever um, more utilised. So projections are only going to go up. Hence, there's, a, there's an enormous opportunity here um, to, to make energy savings and, and in, in improve the energy efficiency of, of all data centres. So, on to the project. So, the project was located in, in Red Hill. Um, it's a, a, a building which can deliver 14 megawatts of IT. Um, what that means is there's the, the electrical infrastructure to deliver power from the grid to the IT equipment, and there is the um, cooling infrastructure uh, to reject the heat from that IT, um, which, which could go up to 14 megawatts. So on the grand scheme of things in the scale of sizes of data centers, this sits around um, a little bit in the middle. Um, there are six what we call data halls or suites in this building. So those are individual spaces with the in, uh, independent infrastructure to serve that space under the, under the umbrella of the, of the whole data center. And typically, each customer, there will be one customer per suite. Um, this, uh, this building, as you can see um, in the diagram there, uh, there is um, a, a chilled water system which provides uh, cooling to, to the IT equipment in, in this space. And um, this system usually consumes somewhere about 10% to 50% of the whole um, of the whole building's uh, energy consumption. In this Red Hill site, um, it was built around uh, 12 or so years ago, um, not really uh, with energy efficiency in mind, more about getting to market uh, as speed as possible, as speedy as possible. So um, energy efficiency kind of took a, a little bit of a, a um, a back a back roll there, so um, the, the chiller plant uh, involved uh, is relatively inefficient. It's it's pretty standard to be honest, and currently consumes around 24% of the of the non-IT energy usage um, for that suite. So um, this is pretty much the um, the the major area of, of energy consumption for this for this particular suite, and hence the area um, that we focus this this energy efficiency deployment. So the project was to, to replace the, the air-cooled chillers, um, which, which were standard, as I said, and had about eight to ten years of remaining, um, remaining life. The ITF fund was um, pretty much
much crucial in us being able to, to early retire uh, that plant and replace them with uh, a top of the range, very, very premium set of three air-cooled chillers, which effectively have four technologies built in, um, which, which allow it to operate more energy efficiently. Um, before I get into that, I will just say that um, why the IETF was so key in being able to make this project um, viable is because um, with this particular facility, the, the contract arrangement was that the, the actual end customer, the owner of the IT, pays all the energy bill. So any energy saved, in fact, actually goes into the, the pocket of the customer rather than the, rather than the, the owner, rather than digital realty. Um, so hence that makes building a business case for these types of projects for, for digital realty to um, invest their own capex um, can be quite difficult without any um, financial support. So we got there and um, we're now in the process of um, these units have been ordered and are on, on its way for delivery to the site um, and they compromise of, of kind of four key specific technologies. Um, the first one is a very, very high efficiency compressor. Um, the compressor is a component within the refrigeration cycle um, and it's the piece within that refrigeration cycle which consumes the most energy. Um, the turbo core compressor, which is the technology utilized in these chillers, uh, is essentially a magnetically levitated compressor, so no bearings, um, which uh, mitigates um, a, a huge portion of the losses involved to that. Um, the second aspect is the integration of, of free cooling capability. So what this means is this is essentially an extra set of, of coils built into the unit there that when the ambient conditions are low enough, um, just outside air can be um, blown over the coils and, and the chilled water temperature reduced to its set point without the use of the refrigeration cycle. Generally more expensive because you've got another set of coils to do that before then you have another heat exchange coil with the refrigeration cycle. Um, the other aspect, um, this is not necessarily so much an energy saving piece, but it's a big, ping, big thing on, on, on the sustainability piece is um, the GWP of the refrigerant used in these new models. So GWP stands for global warming potential. Essentially, a refrigerant um, will uh, leak out the system over time and some refrigerants can be very, very harmful to the, the environment. Um, the uh, GWP now is used in this unit um, is about half that of, of the old units. Uh, and finally, um, the, the controllers for the chillers. So as you saw in the previous diagram, there's actually um, three chillers involved which operate as, as one system. Um, and the uh, controllers, the controller now exists to be able to load the chillers optimally depending on the ambient conditions and the cooling load placed on those chillers. So what that means is if the um, ambient conditions uh, enable it, you operate as many chillers as you can um, to maximize your free cooling of the system, um, minimize your, uh, your compressor power. And, and if it's not possible, then the controller can load the, ch the, the right number of chillers optimally so they're operating at their sweet spot in, term, in terms of their efficiency curve. So um, the benefits that we expect from this project uh, are shown on, on the right-hand side diagram there. The, the orange line is the um, energy usage profile of the, of the old system. On the x-axis, you've got outside air temperature, and on the y-axis, you've got energy usage. And, and the blue line is the projected usage of the, of the new model. You can also see that there is shaded there the full free cooling mode and hybrid free cooling mode. Um, this essentially shows uh, what ambient conditions a system will not actually, will use, well, won't use at all, or will only use a small portion of, of the compressors. So we estimate about 60% of the year based on, based on the uh, current UK climate. Um, that the, uh, the chillers will, will be in a full or, or partial free cooling. So the net result um, is an estimated energy savings of, of 280 megawatt hours a year. Um, if we estimated that typical average house consumes about 
um, thousand kilowatt hours a year, then we're, then we're talking about 280 houses worth of, of energy consumption uh, per year just, just from this project alone. The estimated energy cost savings is 40,000 pounds there, but I must note that actually this was done last year, um, so that's pretty much double. Um, so even better value for money there. Um, so we can almost um, can almost half those payback payback times there, um, and uh, yeah, uh, sixty tons. So that would be a, a approximately sixty tons of, of carbon saved uh, per annum. So uh, this is uh, essentially the the one hundred seven thousand pound grant that we've received of ITF has been crucial in in realising these savings and enabling this this project to move forward. Um, Additionally, there is actually future benefits from this project that we foresee, which are dependent on other parts of the system um, being upgraded. So potentially even further savings that we can we can achieve from this system, which is in the is in the the, the building plan. Um, that is that uh, chillers often have a limit in terms of what uh, water temperature that they can serve at, and that limit's actually it needs to be. Um, uh, at a certain point, so the chillers need to do enough work. If they don't do enough work, they will trip out. Um, and what that means is you can only supply water temperatures to about 12 or 13 degrees C um, from the current standard chiller. However, um, with these with these new models, the technology being implemented to uh, mitigate that, so we can now supply water temperatures of around 18, 19 degrees C, which then ultimately means you, you increase your band of full free cooling um, throughout the year and make further make further energy savings. However, when this is dependent on other systems being upgraded, so at this moment we can't quite capture those savings. So, how did we arrive at this um, this project? Um, essentially, uh, I said we start with identifying the opportunity um, and identifying the locations where. Um, capital investment should be required to make the biggest impact in terms of uh, a site's energy efficiency uh, or even water efficiency. Um, so uh, the the next step is then to kind of find that opportunity uh, and look for any incentives which may exist for that. Um, and then the key thing is, is that we try and get um, some way through that process um, before the, um, the, the uh, our clients will approve budget for it. So you can kind of look at this on a, on a, um, a one calendar year. Um, we need to get um, kind of at least the, the technical approval um, for the grant by about uh, September. So then that we can, you know, that, that plays a factor into, the, into our client's um, approval process because of obviously everyone's asking for money for various projects. Um, and we look to try and get um, the ITF to uh, to make our projects look as attractive as possible um, by that by that cutoff, so we can get these projects funded by the business and, and moving forward. So um, the essentially the point here is that um, our synchronisation with um, our clients' capex management cycle um, is really really important for us. Um, then just a few points in terms of identifying suppliers and costing. See, helpful for us to have as um, uh, as many good relationships with suppliers and vendors as possible, um, so we can uh, something we can get information required for um, the the grant submittal as quickly as possible, um, and also as as accurately as possible. Um, a key thing for us has been um, lead times. Uh, I'm sure we're not the only industry which is struggling um, in terms of uh, lead times on, on key pieces of equipment and, and making sure that that's, um, that's going to be viable with the timeframes in which the IETF put on, um, um, on these projects. Um, so before we even start, we need to make sure that it's going to be doable in, in the timeframes where the, um, the grant is applicable for. Uh, applicability to, to other sites, really, I mean, anywhere where there's um, year-round cooling required. Um, free cooling chillers is a pretty well-recognized um, system in the market. Uh, with In the data center sector, I mentioned, so there's 
I mean, this was just one suite out of six in this building. Um, so potentially could be replicated another six times, and that's just in this building. We said there's maybe around 500 data centers in the UK, and, um, and I would say about 50% of them use the same heat rejection system, this air-cooled chiller system, uh, as Red Hill. So there is a lot of opportunity um, to implement this same sort of system. Um, and I would say only, only relatively recently new builds would incorporate these um, high, highly efficient um, premium chillers as, as standard. And then also into uh, other industrial applications, again, um, because of the expense um, of these um, top of the range chillers, uh, generally, it's, it's probably only going to make sense if, there's, if the cooling requirement is year-round, such as data centers. Um, but uh, yes, uh, there's, there's no doubt it's, it can be applicable. So thank you very much for the opportunity to present, and thank you very much for listening. Could I ask um, Owen and Lily to join us back up on the stage and we'll have our Q&A session. Um, and folks, if you do want to ask a question, pop your hand up, but wait for the microphone to get to you again, just so that we capture it on the recording today. So you can see Ray and Lucinda are getting into position, ready to hand it over. So we'll just wait for Owen to get up here. Lovely. Right, this may be probably more relevant for Lily here. Lily, what are the plans for continuing the IETF fund after the last application window, which is in January next year? Yeah, that's a great question. I've had that a few times this morning as well. Um, so I think ultimately we do recognise that there's a huge amount of demand for the fund. Uh, we've seen great applications come through. We know there's still a lot of really good projects out there. Um, so at the moment, the IETF uh, autumn 2022 window is our final window that we have planned. Um, so the best thing I can encourage you to do is get any applications you can do in now. If you're not quite ready for a deployment, do think about getting a study into us, and at least that's some way that we can help you. Um, we're also really keen to hear your feedback on what that pipeline of projects might look like beyond the current timescale that we have for the ITF. Um, that helps us build the case for why we need a further window, why we might need something else that looks a bit like the ITF in the future. Um, so, yeah, I think for the moment it is our final window, but please do come and uh, have a chat to us. There's myself, there's Nazreen, Olivia in the room. Uh, we're all thinking about what comes next. So, uh, yeah, get your ideas to us and we'll, we'll try and make that happen. Alec Robson, uh, I kind of look at the future. A question for North Shore, really. <clears throat> You're solving the, um, the problem of current data and memory storage. Uh, but that is a field that's moving very quickly in terms of mini miniaturization. Are you solving a problem that really might be solved by the technology itself rather than the energy side? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a very fair point. Um, I mean, yeah, the, there's gonna the, the shift that we are seeing in terms of new ID deployments is is the density in how much compute you can get into a physical space, and ultimately how much power then needs to be consumed in a, in a certain amount of space, and then how much cooling needs to be delivered to it. Um, so so new builds are designed for a much much higher density, but it's still based on essentially servers consuming electrical power and then losing heat. Um, we don't really see much change in the, like, the fundamental computation process, if you see what I mean. Um, that's what we see in the industry at the minute, um, maybe in 10 years, we don't know. Um, but ultimately, I think this is um, the most important point, is that it doesn't seem to be changing at all in terms of the... Um, the need for uh, computation and 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 companies um, using their own IT equipment and locating that in in um, in buildings such as um, such as digital realties co-location space. So, at the minute, this is a kind of uh, it's an urgent issue 
that needs to be made more efficient and we can't really wait for a change in like a, a paradigm shift in the way computation is done um, just to, you know, rather than do nothing, if that makes sense. Hello. Uh, hi. A uh, question for North Shore. It's Animation from uh, Nvidia. We do energy consultancy. I just had a question in terms of the chillers, and, and that's a, a great use. And you look, you talked about um, air cooled chillers. Did you consider water cooled chillers on a closed loop system or anything like that? Uh, uh, yeah, um, but it's it's quite difficult um, to be able to convert convert to a water cooled system um, in most well let's say in this site, which is in Red Hill, and as you can imagine, probably space is kind of quite constricted. So we would need cooling towers as well, or some sort of condenser system to produce condenser water for a water cooled chiller option, which fundamentally there, there wasn't the space involved. Um, that's, really, that's really the main reason for that. Have you, have you considered it on other sites? I mean, not industri maybe industrial sites rather than mm -hmm. residential or built up sites? Yeah, so it's, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a tricky one because Obviously, yeah, leveraging evaporative cooling helps energy, but the other issue that we have is the amount of water stress, um, particularly um, in the locations where most UK data centres are, which is in the, sort of the ring around London. Um, so, in fact, almost water usage becomes even just as scrutinised as, as energy usage at the moment, um, not just here, but, but globally. So, um, generally, there's, I mean... Um, and we've seen some some companies operate with an approach of just not touching evaporative cooling, just using air cooling. Hi. That, that works okay. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thanks. Uh, sorry, it's another question for North Shore. <laughs> um, would Effectively, cooling batteries, uh, batteries can actually store cooling, would that actually help, uh, in essence, uh, some of the work that you're doing? Uh, just, can I briefly ask, so how are we, how's it operating? It's basically uh, electric, uh, thermal batteries that hold effectively thermal energy, mm -hmm. uh, which can actually, uh, you can extract or, or charge up the effect you're used in the chillers. So you can actually yeah. do time shifting and rapid cooling. Right. Yeah. Okay. Like a like a thermal storage system. Yeah. Um, yeah. That uh, that's quite regularly used in in Amster in the Netherlands. Actually, um, they have aquifers where they they leverage that. Um, uh, it, again, a lot of it comes down to like physical space um, to be able to to have that because ultimately when. Uh, uh, data center provider has a plot of land, they want to maximize the amount of space which, is, uh, which IT equipment goes in. So it's really, that's, that's the challenge with, with those sort of things. But if they um, certainly, um, whether it's aquifers or if they're like in the US where there's a bit more space around them, then it is, it is used. I've got a different question. Yeah, well, um, So uh, this is a, my company, Sunamp, or my, not my company, but the company I work for, Sunamp. But this is a different hat on. So before I joined Sunamp, I was actually a, a senior officer in the local authority. Is there any integration between what you're doing, I'm picking up on the water cooling question behind me, uh, of linking actually data centers to effectively yeah. things like district heating networks and, and things like that? Yeah, um, that's. I think that's what, we really, really want to see, and I think most people want to see it makes total total sense. Um, the The barriers to that that we've seen is is it comes down to the the commercials. So there's a couple of things with that. So um, data centres are obviously classed as mission critical. So um, there is uh, there's always so they're, they're designed to essentially operate ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the time, and so they need to be able to reject their their heat. So um, 
the one of the challenges with that is making sure that if it's connected to a, a district heating system that there is always going to be a demand for that heat and hence the data center can can reject that heat if there's no demand um, then they're going to need some other way of rejecting that heat which um, previously we've seen means that they end up installing a sort of backup system which then almost means nearly double the capex so um, that is one thing uh, and the other thing is the, is the grade of the heat um, uh, older buildings potentially operate uh, a little bit cooler um, which means the heat rejected is quite low grade um, which can be a bit of a, an issue um, but there is a trend to essentially um, IT equipment is coming more and more um, uh, okay with operating at higher conditions and therefore then the rejected heat can be a higher temperature as well so um, but it is I mean it's happening it does happen a lot in Scandinavia it happens a lot in Dublin um, the applications of it in the UK uh, aren't uh, are few and far between to be honest which hopefully will change Okay, Tim Chire from um, SI UK, uh, so industrial company. It's a question for Jenny and Lily that picks up on that. It, it was mentioned that there's this mismatch in incentives between the building owner potentially and the tenant, which, which is not just data center problem, it's, it's more broad. And then when you talk about district heat, you've got different stakeholders who need to play together. So sort of from a policy perspective, as well as just like a fund that gives money, are there things being worked on that can help iron out ca carrots or sticks to help iron out those kind of uh, things? Yeah, I'll perhaps start off and then uh, Jenny, I, you might well be able to speak to more things that are going on in the innovation space where I know generally in the innovation space we do have a lot of good schemes that are really good at bringing people together, whether that be from Innovate UK or UKRI. It's all about trying to build up those relationships and those initial ideas. I think we are aware that when you get to the kind of deployment stage in grant funding, because we're trying to do a lot of different things, we tend to have schemes that have quite specific objectives. So the ITF kind of draws a line around your site and looks at what we can do in your industrial processes to reduce the energy or reduce the consumption, uh, reduce the consumption of energy. I meant to say emissions. Um, so yeah, I think we we've seen some really good projects come through where. We can do something on the site, but it's also enabling something wider and bigger. So kind of like was mentioned earlier with the CELSA example, by reducing the emissions from the, the shredding process, you're actually enabling this much bigger impact through the whole sort of value chain and reducing sort of wider scope through emissions. We want to see more of that. We're kind of looking at what our funds are doing and what they're achieving, trying to learn the lessons, seeing how more of those sort of wider benefits could be leveraged from what we're doing. Um, on the heat network side, there's been the heat network investment program that's been running for some time, it's delivered some really good things. Um, there's nothing to stop people from applying to both sorts of funds as long as we're not duplicating the costs that are claimed. Um, but I think definitely there's, there's sort of always the opportunity to look for what more can be done to join all of this up. Um, and I think we, we really welcome the feedback on that as well and what's your own experience of what the barriers have been, where's grant funding not quite doing it, what more do we need to do? I don't know, Jenny, if there's any more. No. <laughs> I can't add any um, information about new funds. I think Lily's covered probably most of them. There have been funds in the past, though, that have linked up industrial and domestic and brought it all together in energy systems, like Prospering from the Energy Revolution was a programme run by um, Bayes and Innovate UK as well that did that, tried to bring everybody together so that we were sort of using the energy across the whole system more efficiently rather than just focusing on bits of the system. Um, but if I hear of anything, I will definitely let you know. Of course you can, yeah. Uh, sorry. Um, just from a, a, a policy perspective, I suppose just to reassure you, we recognise um, the issues that you're flagging. It's things that we, you know, within government we've been, been trying to look at for a long time. It's obviously been a, um, how to describe it, a politically hectic time for us recently um, and so I'm, I'm not going to give you a, an answer but just know that these are the types of things we are thinking about with the new ministerial team um, and trying to look at that and kind of give us a, a longer term view of what that might be so it's all things that are on our minds as the policy advisors kind of looking at this where it ends up 
you know, we shall see, but it's certainly on our minds. So just to know that we do know that. And as Lily says, for everyone in the room, as you're kind of coming across these examples of where you see disconnects perhaps in, um, in or problems you come across to reaching those uh, decarbonisation goals, let us know we're all ears because um, that's what kind of makes us better policy advisors. So, yeah, keep us posted. And, and just to introduce, this is uh, Livia Absalom, who's the Deputy Director of the RUTF. So definitely worth somebody to talk to. <laughs> Any other questions? Any last ones now? Oh, lots. Okay, can we come over this time, Ray? Back. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name's Andrew Braley from uh, Jacobs. Uh, we're uh, an engineering consultancy company. I've got a question for Owen from Celsa, please. Um, so you talked a lot about the circularity of the process, Owen, and I got that. Can you just talk a little bit about uh, my interest is around the decarbonisation and different uh, sort of clean energy sources that you might use for your process? And for the electric art furnace in, in particular, are you looking at other clean energy sources, um, for example, away from fossil fuels or you know, more towards hydrogen or more sort of use of electrification, that kind of thing? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> we, we, at the moment, the electric arc furnace is, is supplied by the grid, and, and so we're, we're reliant on the grid mix of, of renewables. The, where, we're, where we have control is, is the reheat furnaces that we have on the rolling mills, which currently use um, natural gas. And, we are, and in fact, we, we, we've done a feasibility study with, with uh, Innovate on switching that, those, those uh, furnaces to hydrogen. And that also links back into the, in the, the South Wales industry cluster, where they're, they're looking at the, 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 the um, production and distribution networks that are needed before we can then utilise that hydrogen. So that, that's one of the things, the areas where we're looking at. Hopefully that's enough. Yeah. And the final question is the lady down here. Hello, this is Aya from Random Waste Management. My question is going to be for Lily, please. Um, I would like to know a little bit more when it comes to the um, deep decarbonisation, um, the fuel switching part of it. Um, what kind of restrictions are with biogas, for example? So as I mentioned, we, I come from this company that does waste management. So we have got landfill gas. Um, we are planning on, on upgrading this to biomethane, for example. Um, we could, could we use it as a part of the fuel switching? Yeah, strategy. great question. Um, so we have some quite specific rules around the use of biogas and biomethane, um, partly because there are some other incentives in place outside of the ITF. So there's the green gas support scheme that gives you uh, incentives towards basically injecting that biomethane back into the grid. Um, so we want to make sure that that sort of incentive is still there. We think that's a great use of that gas that you're producing. Um, you can, though, if, if you don't have access to the gas grid, um, and there's no means to supply that, that landfill gas that you have, um, then you can definitely uh, use it within your own processes um, if that will help you to decarbonise, switch away from another fossil fuel. Um, so if that's the case and it's an off-grid site, then we can basically fund you to make any of the on-site adaptations that you'd need to utilise that uh, biomethane within your process. We don't support the um, biomethane upgrading or biogas production element itself. But everything after that, uh, we can help you with. I hope that's the case for your site, but we can definitely talk afterwards. Yeah, we, are kind of we, we are kind of thinking as well um, when it comes to the transportation, kind of like from the transition of diesel to, to biomethane, for example. Is this something that you could help with as well? Um, so it is to a certain extent. So um, we, we really recognise that um, by not funding non-road mobile machinery, we were really missing a trick because that's such an energy intensive process um, it's a big opportunity to switch that equipment away from fossil fuels to things like bio uh, biogas and biomethane um, so if you've got that kind of equipment on your site we can help you with that um, we don't support essentially anything off-site so uh, transport like hgvs that would be going between sites we wouldn't be able to fund that thank you thanks thank you all very much and let's thank our speakers in the traditional way Hi everyone, welcome back after your coffee break. I know that some of you have already met five people, so that's really overachieving. But please do carry on networking uh, during this afternoon. 
We're going to move on now with the um, second half of our IUTF funded projects. So we'll hear from Hasco Metals and also from NSG Pilkington. Um, and then we'll have another Q&A session. So another chance for you to ask questions uh, um, to the two speakers that you will have heard from. Um, we'll then have a bit of lunch. And then, as I say, the minister is still coming. So that's great. So he'll be here at uh, about 1.40, hopefully. And you'll be able to so do start thinking about what questions you could ask him, because he's only going to be here for a short amount of time. So have those questions ready. Um, and then we'll have our panel discussion after that. So without further ado, I'm going to hand on over to our next speaker, Abhishek Astana from, um, I've forgotten the name, sorry, uh, Industrial Energy Pioneers Limited, who's been working with Hasco Metals um, at their asphalt plant. Over to you. Thanks, Jenny. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, sorry, it's still morning. Uh, yeah, I'm abs absolutely delighted to be present before all of you today and talking to you about our IETF-funded feasibility study of waste heat recovery at Hasco Metals Group. So my name is Abhishek. I'm the director of Industrial Energy Pioneers. We are the suppliers of the feasibility study. And I've got with me uh, Kim Baton, who is a project coordinator at Hasco. So over to you, Kim. Hi, um, I'll just speak a little bit about Stillfelt. Hasco Environment Stillfelt <laughs> uh, has been developing and manufacturing high performance asphalt products from steel slag and limestone for row making in the UK since the 1960s. Success has come from steel slag being environmentally friendly and it's recycling aggregate from a secondary project process. Its properties are very good for use in asphalt when controlled right, it's what Hasco specialises in. There are over 200 asphalt products for specific applications and these include steel pave, steel surf, steel flex, steel flow, ultra grip and cold bit. So about us, uh, sorry. aggregates of specific sizes and sand are mixed together according to specific products and recipes. Aggregates could be limestone, steel slag or hardstone. Steel slag, once conditioned, called the weathering process, is made exactly the same as traditional nat natural aggregate asphalt. There is no additional equipment required, etc., to manufacture or install. The mixture is then dried and heated to a specific temperature and then bitumen is finally added to the mixture to make asphalt. Making asphalt is like uh, baking a big cake. Uh, ingredients are added and, and mixed together. Light cakes have different recipes for flavours. There is a different asphalt recipe to get different performances. So for our energy use, drying and heating the aggregates consume large quantities of energy. The plant is designed to operate using multiple fuels chosen by price at the moment. That includes natural gas, gas oil and furnace flame. And our annual fuel demand is around 36 megawatt hours per year. The asphalt industry as a whole is committed to driving environmental improvements and still felt pride themselves on continuously looking at new innovations that are environmentally friendly. Hasco are very keen to operate in a sustainable manner and minimise our environmental impact and have taken up many initiatives. Using recycled plastic polymers to replace a percentage of bitumen, uh, we've carried out successful trials using lignin, a natural binder, to replace a percentage of bitumen. Lignin has been used in trials um, elsewhere around the world, but we are the first to do the live trials in the UK and the world's first to use it with steel slag. Using a third-party energy specialist uh, consultancy company to deliver workshops on energy management and best practice and to carry out site assessments to find any energy saving projects, which is different to the IETF one that we're doing now. Um, we're using recycled um, rail ballast, which can be um, alternatives to quarried limestone, and using recycled asphalt planings as well to obviously reduce our aggregate consumption. Now we're looking at 
trying to recover waste from our, from our heat processes and to use it to offset external energy demand of our site. This is where the feasibility study was required. And I'll let Abhishek take over. Thank you, Kim. So at this point, um, Hosco appointed us as the supplier for the feasibility study because Hosco are absolutely brilliant with all the environmentally friendly asphalt products they make, but um, waste heat recovery required other resources which has to be sourced externally. For example, energy engineering expertise and experience. Then, of course, the study required uh, specific instruments for making various measurements to establish the conditions of operation of plant. So we bring uh, a number of specialized equipment, thermal imaging cameras, uh, temperature sensors, pressure sensors, flue gas analyzers, all these things which form key information before you design a waste heat recovery system. And also the financial support because this feasibility study required a number of tests to be conducted uh, on the plan. So to establish base load conditions, peak average conditions, and so on, and how the variations affect and how the heat sources and heat sinks change over time. So required a number of tests which added to the cost. And because of this, financial support was required. And uh, they also appointed us because we've had a very successful track record with IETF projects. So, so far we've done uh, five IETF projects and two IHRS projects. <coughs> so we basically prepared the grant application for our client and it was successful and we would like to thank the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy for the financial support without which this ambitious project would not have taken place. Right, so what we're doing technically, uh, the key theme is energy, uh, waste heat recovery and utilization from the process, uh, recovering the waste heat in the asphalt making process and utilizing it on site itself. So um, when you try to recover waste heat, you have to find the right temperature range at which you recover it. And what we do here in this case is we have designed or we planning to implement a three-stage waste heat recovery process to optimize the recovery potential at different temperature ranges. So first we'll recover the highest grade waste heat, that means high temperature heat which can be used for multiple applications to produce hot water which will then feed an organic Rankin cycle generator to produce electricity for the site. This electricity produced on site will power various electrical drives and motors and crushers and so on. Uh, then the medium grade heat, so lower temperatures, will be used, will be recovered using recuperators and transferred to the gas burners or whichever fuel we're using those burners. So the idea is if you supply preheated air to your burners instead of cold ambient air, you would uh, see immediate fuel reduction. So as a rule of thumb, for every 20 degrees Celsius of preheat that you do to the air, you would save about 1% on your fuel consumption. Finally, the lowest grade heat, that means at very low temperatures, which cannot be used for anything else, we'll still find a use for it and use it to preheat and dry the feedstock. So these are the aggregates. Uh, and sand and things like that lying out um, in various heaps and we'll use that heat to dry or preheat that before it goes into the burners, uh, the, the dryer system. So by doing this three-stage heat recovery system, we'll extract the last drop of heat available in the process. The project has huge energy saving potentials. I mean, it promises to save uh, 870 megawatt hours of electricity per year and 3,700 megawatt hours of gas or any other equivalent fuel, gas, oil, or furnace flame. And it has a carbon saving potential of nearly a thousand tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. 
And if you find it feasible, it will be implemented at Haskell's other sites. So they've got one site in Rotherham, which is the primary site, but they've got other sites, one in Cardiff and around the world in several countries as well, where it might be ex uh, extrapolated. So just a b brief background of uh, our company, Industrial Energy Pioneers. We've uh, been working on a variety of energy efficiency and decarbonization projects. We work both on developing cutting edge technology as well as implementing established technology but engineered to the specific needs for our clients to make it tailor-made. So just a few examples to list, uh, to give you an example. So we work with uh, leisure centers, energy efficiency in leisure centers, heat pumps, uh, energy efficiency in manufacturing process, both on the electrical and heating side, uh, specialized products for uh, thermal, better thermal insulation, uh, hydroelectric generators, baking ovens, industrial baking ovens. So here we've done two, um, two types of technologies. One is um, a centrifugal technology to separate the moist air from dry air so that you can extract the vapor and then without reducing the temperature, without having to condense the moisture and continue to recycle hot air inside these ovens, which will greatly enhance uh, the energy efficiency of the site. We've also done a project with Nestle's Kit Kat factory in York, uh, which was funded by Innovate UK, and we achieved uh, close to 15% energy savings on that Kit, Kit Kat factory where they make wafers for Kit, Kit Kats. Uh, we've worked on modular wind turbine blades, liquid fill, uh, liquid cool server racks. So we've had an interesting presentation about data centers this morning. Uh, but uh, so the, the, that's air cool technology. Uh, here we fill liquids inside the server, uh, ca uh, inside the CPU itself. So this is a dielectric liquid, which would conduct heat but not electricity. So you won't have short circuits. But it's much more compact and dense and offers much higher fuel efficiencies. Uh, biomass pelleting mills, combined heat and power stations. We developed the UK's first autoclave for processing municipal solid waste. So this is now operational since 2012, I believe, in Wakefield, uh, run by Shanks Environment. We work with oil and gas. Uh, we developed the, we've been working with the government of India to develop the largest waste to energy plant in India. So we work with all kinds of industrial sectors, mining, manufacturing, glass, cement, minerals, metals, uh, food, just to name a few, all sizes of data centers, so different temperature ranges of heat uh, from very low temperatures in data centers to high temperatures in casting industries in excess of 1,000 degrees Celsius, and all uh, sizes of plants from few uh, kilowatts to several megawatts. And we've had a good uh, success history, so we've had uh, seven... Uh, uh, I mean, five IETF-funded projects, of which two are mentioned here, William Cook and Steel Fall, the Haskell Steel Fall project that we're here to talk about. I'm not, um, Jenny told me this morning that I can't talk about the other three because this is still classified information. So until BASE have published the names of those clients on their website, we can't say that publicly, but I'll tell you privately if you ask me. <laughs> Uh, so in addition to the five IETF projects, we've also had two IHRS projects. So IHRS is, uh, I don't want to preempt you, but it's the Industrial Heat Recovery Support Program, which ran from 2018 to 2020. And that was like a precursor to the IETF. So we had two IHRS projects as well. We've had nine other grants from Innovate UK, several ERDF grants, European grants, and so on. Uh, we basically prepare, uh, we basically take charge of the whole project for our clients from start to finish, including gathering information, preparing grant applications for you. We offer all three services, feasibility studies and deployment of energy efficiency or decarbonization projects. We take charge of the full project, so if you're not familiar with the grant application process, it can 
sound like a very daunting task at first, but we've been doing it for years. So we can do it all for you, but also when you get the grant, it's not so easy. There are lots of conditions you need to comply with. We help you, we offer you full support, we prepare all the quarterly reports, we liaise with the monitoring officers, we prepare all the claims. All you have to do is read it and submit it. That's it, you get paid. Right, so I've got um, two of my other co-directors with us. We've got Andy Holgate there and Tim Griffiths. And between Andy and I, we've done more than 200 energy efficiency and decarbonization projects. We've had a 100% success record in IETF and IHRS grants. And we'll minimize the cost to you of conducting a feasibility study if you want to do that first, or deployment, whatever, help you get the maximum that you can get from grant. Uh, and um, some of our clients are saving up to 22% on their energy bills already. The, the last thing is we are giving unbiased recommendations because we are not ourselves suppliers of equipment. We are consultant engineers, energy engineers. So we do not have a specific technology to sell you. Right? For example, if you go and ask a barber, what do I need? Well, you need a haircut, sir. So we are not in that boat. We'll give you what is actually best for you. And we work with all kinds of suppliers around, around the country from all, of all kinds of equipment. So you talk about burners, you talk about boilers, you talk about economizers, recuperators, heat exchangers, uh, thermal storage, electrical storage, whatever you need, and EPC contractors, finally, who could put it all together and give you a turnkey project with uh, guarantees of performance. Right, so just to summarize, uh, we've got lots of skill and experience of energy efficiency projects. Uh, we've got a 100% record in IETF and IHRS all base applications, uh, base grant applications, and we can help you prepare the, your grant application. We get you uh, access to industry leading technologies, EPC contractors, reliable. We got academic and scientific service providers. So in addition to industrial energy providers, I'm also a reader in energy engineering and director of Hallam Energy at Sheffield Hallam University. And we give you unbiased recommendations. So here are our contact details. We'll be around at, at lunchtime as also the networking event at three o'clock. Thank you. Thanks very much to, to Kim as well. Sorry, Kim, I didn't realise you were presenting as well. So thank you to both of the speakers. And Abhishek, what a busy man. There's a lot on there. <laughs> so next up, we have our next project from NSG Pilkington. Sam Hurst, who is the Process Development Manager at NSG, is going to tell you about his... Um, oh, is this a double act as well? OK, <laughs> I'll let you introduce yourselves. Let me move on to your slides. There we go. Good afternoon, everyone. So, just to introduce, um, I'm Sam Hurst, Engineering and Process Development Manager um, at NGF Europe. This is Luke Barnett, Process Development Engineer. We're going to talk today about our uh, energy efficiency project on site, uh, some of the problems that we faced, uh, our proposal to that, and how the IATF helped us shape our solutions, and then some of the benefits that it brought. But firstly, a little bit about NGF Europe. We're based in St. Helens, Merseyside. We're part of the NSG Pilkington Group. Um, and we are the market leaders in the production of glass cord products. We're the largest of our five glass cord manufacturing sites within the NSG Group. We're a 24-7 operation with around 250 employees. Glass cords are used to reinforce synchronous drive belts in the automotive industry, and we also have a wide range of industrial applications. So this is our product. It's the, the blue bobbin. It's 20 kilos of cord roughly one millimetre in diameter, and on that spool is around 10,000 metres of cord, and we supply that to all our belting customers for them to integrate into their transmission belts, and here's some of our applications. So you can see we have the timing belt in the internal combustion engine, but we also have a lot of industrial applications just here, uh, from large transmission belts to very small ones that you might get in your inkjet printers, for example. We've got some emerging markets now as well, so bicycles are now being driven with belts, certainly the electric bicycles, and we're getting some applications with electric scooters. So the glass cord process, 
We start by melting glass. We take glass batch and we melt that at temperatures above 1600 degrees and we draw that filament onto high speed winders. We create a seven micron fiber, that's roughly one tenth the diameter of the human hair. And in this particular process, in a year, we can produce around 20 million kilometers of fiber. And just a bit of perspective, that's enough to run to the moon maybe 50 times. We then take those filaments, maybe bundle three together, and we coat them in a resource null formaldehyde latex bath before passing that through a drying oven. We evaporate the water, we cure the RFL, and we twist that onto spools. We take multiple spools, maybe 10 to 20, and twist those cords together to create a cord. And then our final process is where we apply an adhesive coating. It's solvent-based, we pass it through a, an oven, we evaporate the solvent, leaving the customer-specific coating on our bobbin, and that's our finished product. It's in this area that we have our improvement project, so a little bit more about it. We take cord, we coat it in the adhesive, we evaporate the solvent. And the solvent-laden waste gas, we extract from the oven and pass it through uh, thermal oxidizers to treat the waste gas before emitting that air to atmosphere at a whopping 450 degrees. We have a recirculation loot in the, in the oven, so we are recovering a little bit of that heat. We take it into the thermal oxidizer, we cover it and send it back to the oven. A little bit of project background. So in 2019, we approved a project to replace those thermal oxidizers. They were outdated, reaching the end of their life, and they had the dual functionality of pollution control as well as oven heating. We approved a project to include a common pollution control plant um, and integrate it with our existing ovens, and we installed two regenerative thermal oxidizers. In 2020, we were successful with the Industrial Heat Recovery Support Programme, and that helped us integrate post-abatement um, heat recovery. And at the back of the pollution control plant, we were able to recover heat. It left provision for us to utilise that heat to return to our ovens. However, our ovens weren't capable. The waste heat that we recovered from the RTOs would be so variable that we're not capable of ameliorating that temperature in our ovens. We was getting a 40 degree swing from the heat recovered and we needed just a five degree range within our ovens. So it meant we needed new ovens and coating baths so we could uh, maximize the heat recovered from our uh, RTO system. And the Industrial uh, Energy Transformation Fund supported and enabled, to, enabled us to extend the scope and include new ovens with heat modulation systems and coating systems. And it became a critical process step um, that would help us ensure and maximise environmental operation and financial benefits. Now Luke's going to take us through uh, the technical aspects of the project. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, so I'm hoping to give you an insight as to uh, what we were going to do and what we are doing now thanks to the IETF. Uh, these pictures show uh, our existing equipment. So the green item is actually our oven, so a big long 12 metre box. The orange is the ducting and the fans that controls the air going around in the oven. And red is the existing incinerator. p and on the right give some uh, basic values. So we're at about 140 degrees inside the oven. A couple of fans suck some air out of that oven, recirculate it round through a shell and tube heat exchanger here. There's only a single control valve that can bypass that. So we have one knob to twist when controlling that temperature. And then that gets blown back into the oven. The oven overall needs to be kept negative uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, for the operators. And two, because the cards going in um, solvent's been evaporated off and we don't really want to have an explosion. So when this was originally conceived, the regulations allowed for up to 40% LEL, LEL's lower explosion limit. So that's effectively how many molecules of xylene in this case you can have in your lump of air before you risk having an explosion if there's an open flame. So we set this fume fan to get as close as we can realistically to 40% because that's more efficient. That's then preheated through another shell and tube heat exchanger, goes across the burner, is heated up to 800 degrees to destroy all the volatiles, and then that 800 degree gas goes across these heat exchangers that we're all recovering heat from, and we, we get a bit back. But even with that, we're still losing about 450 degrees. The original plan, as Sam mentioned, 
wants to use this existing equipment. Here's a couple of pictures of it now. We didn't really want to do this. 30 years old, a lot of manual handling involved um, from the dip process and the bath process, difficult access, inefficiencies. This whole area had to be ATEX rated because nothing was contained. With that additional ETF funding, it gave effectively a blank sheet of paper, we could take a step back and we could review the whole design from a, from almost like from a, from a, uh, from a fresh. Uh, the diagram shows here uh, the two RTOs on well, towards the middle and then the shared ducting running across and then we're actually going to be replacing all four of these existing ovens with four nice new ones, all still 12 metres long with their own mixing and their own baths uh, and a little 3D CAD of what that roughly looks like. So with that blank piece of paper, it's allowed us to kind of um, do some quite nice things from a design perspective. So we did a 3D point scan of the whole site. From that, we've been able to generate a full 3D model of the site. That then we've been able to use to create a nice four-dimensional timeline showing the rough uh, events of install. And then actually we put it into a virtual reality environment as well. So we had suppliers, uh, operators, and uh, maintenance technicians reviewing these layouts and designs before any metal has been cut as well. That's given us some real confidence uh, in the designs and what the capabilities will be. Four-dimensional timeline here, so we're showing the RTOs going in, the ducting going in, and now thanks to the IETF as well, we've been able to add this extra section here where we've put a platform up. We've got a hole in the side of the building, ripped out the old equipment, and then we've got our nice new equipment being swung in. And so going into a bit more detail on the actual pieces of equipment, start with baths and mixing here and here. So we have a photograph here of our new mixing system and a photograph here of our um, new bath system fresh out of the factory. Uh, our old system was very manual for the, from a mixing perspective, pretty much had a big bucket and then operators would take some smaller buckets and manually pour those buckets in weigh it out and then they'd walk away for about eight hours just leaving the process as is and then they'd come back and go oh I'll put a couple more buckets in. Um, we didn't have recirculation on it so we had to still cool the dip so the baths had jackets on them. It was quite inefficient as well it meant that our chillers uh, we had a lot of glycol in our chillers and we were running down at um, around minus five degrees uh, just to try and keep our temperature in our baths to around 20 degrees. So we decided to do a full recirc instead. Um, so this has allowed us then also put some Coriolis flow meters in the loop. So now we've got closed loop uh, dip density control. Um, this means it will automatically top itself up. And rather than relying on the operators doing tests, the system will now recognize if we started to evaporate off some solvent just naturally into the atmosphere. And it will then accordingly alter the recipe. It's also closed loop the temperature control, so these pipes along here, it's a coaxial heat exchanger. So the fluid is pumped through here, it has a jacket round it, and it's allowed us to turn the chiller heat up because it's, uh, it's now a lot more efficient and it's simplified the baths dramatically. The operators as well used to have to walk around with a spec sheet, they'd have to adjust things like roller speeds, agitators, rest, um, dip ratios. All that's now been simplified for them, they simply select something on HMI and then they can walk away, and it alarms if something's wrong for them. Overall, this has allowed us to reduce dip waste and manual handling for the operators. We're now in 200 litre drums rather than um, 25 litre drums. Another good advantage, we've actually moved everything in. So that's allowed us to derate the whole area, so it's no longer an ATEX area. And then even inside the booths themselves, there's only a zone 2 any area because it's enclosed in a relatively small area. We've actually hooked these up to the pollution plants as well. So this duct in here. Uh, this means that every smell, every whiff of solvent now we're recovering, going back to the pollution plant, it's getting ignited, we're recovering that energy. Um, and so we've gone from something like 10 emission points to a single emission point, now all going through actually a much hotter process as well. So we're, we're actually destroying even more volatiles. So that's the baths and the mixing. And now talking a bit more now about the baths and the ovens, we want to try and save some energy there. And I'm going to use a metaphor 
um, of um, sun-dried tomatoes for our card. So we don't actually want to bake our card, we want to dry it. But we don't want to fully dry it out like a sun-dried tomato. Now the variables you've got with that would be how long you leave the tomato out, um, how hot of a day it is and how windy of a day it is. On our two old processes, we have a single dip process. You can see the star going along here. It would go in through the bath under the rollers. You then have 12 metres in the oven. It would then go around a pulley and then have another 12 metres in the oven. But then the, we had a double dip process where, unfortunately, the only place we could put the baths was at the rear of the oven. That means we're only getting 12 metres along uh, in between each dip. So in order to get enough solvent evaporated off in that distance, we had to slow down the winders, affecting throughput, but also up the temperatures of the oven, again, increasing gas consumption. And the Eureka moment was realising, actually, we can just double stack our single dip process, which then gives us our double dip process, but maintains that longer time inside the oven. So that's our new process now. So it goes dip in, round, so a full 24 metres for one dip, and then a full 24 metres for the other dip. This has allowed us to speed up the process whilst actually still reducing temperatures inside the oven. Another way in which we could reduce temperatures inside the oven was increasing how windy our day is. So with the new oven design, you have four kind of distinct zones. Um, we have the inlet plenum on top, and this is kind of the clever bits that we, we really needed to make the whole thing work. So this takes the hot air from the RTO, comes in at the top, it then has a choice, it's either correct or it can control and ameliorate that temperature by mixing it with fresh air or if there's not enough solvents in the system at this point during startup, there's also an indirect burner that can top up the heat. There's then a fan that recirculates around this area, maintaining the positive pressure. And then each individual zone, so we have three zones, each with its own individual VFD uh, controlled fan and proportional controlled um, dampener valves. Uh, each one can open up to try and hit its set point. Again, giving us further degrees of control, it's allowed us to refine our process, improve our quality and reduce waste. Uh, another advantage is, well, advantage slash disadvantage. So regulations now with the RT only allows us to run at up to 20% LEL, which means we have to effectively now suck twice as much air out of our process than what we previously did which means more energy. However, with sucking more air out, you're now sucking more air in, so you have a greater uh, amount of um, air moving inside the oven. So that's allowed us to drop the temperature further. So now we're, we've gone from about 145 degrees down to about 110 degrees. With the RTOs as well in that pollution plant and with this additional control and with those lower temperatures, it's now meant that once we actually let it go in, we can run the entire process purely on the waste with no natural gas input. Um, I think that's mostly due to temperature reductions and orders of magnitude uh, higher surface areas inside the heat exchangers down at the RTO checker packs and in the plate heat exchangers and heat recovery. Another nice advantage is uh, these ones are just naturally larger than the old ones. Uh, because of the new car path, it's improved access for the operators to thread it up, so that speeds up downtime and for cleaning. We've also standardised, so our process, when I showed you before, we had four ovens. There was one 60 end oven, so you can run 60 cards through it at one time, and then three 36 end ovens. We've now standardised on three 60, uh, four 60 end ovens, so that's increased our potential capacity from 168 cards to 240. And then finally, just covering uh, on some data collection that it's enabled us to do. So with all this nice new shiny equipment, they've all come with nice new shiny PLCs and HMIs that we can plug in to our existing SCADA system on site. And that's allowed us to do some quite advanced data logging. Uh, and we're getting some really nice correlations now. Uh, one good example is we measure how many cards we're putting in with uh, the LEL sensors inside the ductwork. Uh, which then correlates to gas consumption and dip consumption. The more cards you put in, the more dip you collect. The more dip you collect, the more solvent there is to evaporate in the oven. The more solvent that evaporates, the higher the LEL, because there's more, more solvent in there. And then that's more fuel available for the RTO to burn, which then means it doesn't need to burn natural gas. 
it's also been good to actually prove the concept as well. So on, our, on the first PNID that I went through, we had an incinerator temperature about 800 degrees, but about 450 degrees up into the stack. Now in the process with these reduced temperatures, uh, by the time it gets over to here, we're about 80 degrees going into the RTOs. We're then going up to about 840, up to 900 degrees, which is good because it means that we're destroying even more volatiles. Um, it's then, we're then managing to recover over 100 degrees back to the process, which again wouldn't have been possible without, without the IETF support. And then by the time we've recovered that heat out of it again, we're only putting 76 degree temperature up the stack. So we've gone from a process that was running at 140 degrees and putting 450 degrees up the stack to now we're, we're only putting about 80 degrees in and then the 76 degrees only going up the stack. And then this data as well is actually providing support for future energy saving projects. One that we're hoping to do next year is actually now stabbing into uh, the exhaust stack of the RTO and we're going to recover a little bit more of that heat again for some room space heating that's just around the corner from this installation. I'll now pass back to Sam uh, to summarise. Okay, so looking at some of the project benefits, we knew there'd be energy savings before we started working with ITF, but we've been able to maximise that and we're going to be able to reduce our natural, ga natural gas consumption by around 4,500 megawatt hours a year. That's roughly 800 tonnes of carbon uh, emissions and uh, around 10% of uh, the site's annual emissions currently. The financial benefits of that is that we are reducing the amount of kilowatts in the, um, per kilogram of unit that we make. This will reduce uh, that around by six kilowatt hours per kilogram in our bobbins, and the value of that to us is around £350,000 worth of gas cost savings a year. There's waste reduction. Luke mentioned we have the closed loop density control now, so we can optimise exactly how much adhesive we put on our cords. When we do that, we reduce our internal waste and we push up our yields. The capability improvements are the density control of overcoat, but also the independent uh, oven zone control. So again, we can dial in the exact temperatures we want to into the ovens to make sure that we make right first time. And again, it's less internal scrap and it yields up. The environment, we're collecting all the fugitive emissions. We've booted it all in. We've created a better working environment for our operators uh, and maximising the waste uh, heat recovery potential. And it's a fully transferable design to any of our glass cord sites. I think starting the project before ITF, we knew there'd be energy savings, we knew there'd be good financial benefits, um, but this lot is what we can't quantify yet. And as we move into some of the operation of this plant, we expect these benefits to have significant impact on our business. So just finally, IETF support. Uh, it allowed us to extend the scope of our project uh, to include the new drying ovens and the coating systems. Uh, without that support, it wouldn't have been possible to proceed in the way that we have. And with the grant fund agreed, I think we became more aspirational and innovative, uh, and it allowed us to design a system that minimises all our wastes, improves process control, enhances our equipment safety, improves the working environment, and allows provision for future product development. The modern technology, so all the data that we're getting out, will help us drive uh, further continuous improvement uh, with traceability and process capability potential. And all of that allows us um, to reduce our environmental burden, reduce our manufacturing costs, remain competitive in the market and secure operations at the St. Helens site. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much indeed. That was a tremendous presentation from both of you. The question that I asked of that uh, presentation was in-house sweaty blood and tears and how much was an outside consultant employed? Uh, if it's uh, politic not to mention it, just simply say you did most of it in-house. It, it was all in-house. Um, we worked uh, on the design loop, uh, created all the initial P&IDs to integrate 
uh, the new ovens uh, with the waste heat potential that we have and we, we work with oven providers and coating providers uh, to deliver it. Sam just said to me, I think everybody's hungry, and he might be right. We just have two more things to do. So that is the end of our four funded projects from the ITF that you're going to see today, but we still have more to come this afternoon from the Industrial Heat Recovery Support Programme. Um, a little um, job for you to do over your lunch break, which is the next thing for you to enjoy. Um, we would like you, if you don't mind, to complete a very short survey you don't need to don download any software or anything like that. You just go to this website on your phone, on your uh, tablets, and punch in this code. And we've got five questions for you. This is to help Bayes to shape what we hope, we'll see what the minister says, uh, future funding might look like. So if you have really loved the IETF and you want more of the same, go to the survey and say you'd like more of the same. If there's something that was missing from the IETF and you would have preferred it if it had been funding a different area, go to the survey, share that with us. Uh, if there's any other form of support, like tax incentives and things like that, then again, we want your feedback so that we can make sure that if there is the potential for further support next year, um, it is tailored to what you actually need. So I'm going to um, leave that up on the screen um, for the first half of lunch anyway. If you, it's only going to take five, ten minutes at most, um, unless you have a lot to say, I guess. Um, but we'd really appreciate your feedback on that. So we are now breaking for lunch. Um, just to run over, obviously, do the survey for us, have something to eat, network, meet those five people. Um, you can still sign up for one-to-ones. There's still places available if you want to talk to one of the industrial sites at the end of the event. And also, if you want to, again, if you haven't had a chance to put your card on the networking wall, you can still do that. Um, I'll probably do that at the start of lunch so that people see your information before the end of lunch. But other than that, thank you all very much, and um, lunch is served just outside. Okay, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your lunch and continued all the great networking that's been going on this morning. Um, next up, I'm very delighted to say that we have the Minister with us today, uh, particularly on such a busy day in Parliament. Lord Callanan is the Minister for Business, Energy and Corporate Responsibility, appointed in 2020. He has a degree in electrical and electronic engineering and worked as a project engineer at Scottish and Newcastle breweries in his earlier career. So that gives him a hands-on experience of some of the challenges that we face. And a particular interest of his is industrial energy efficiency. So I would like to invite Lord Cannon to share his views with us on industrial energy efficiency. Well, thank you very much indeed for the uh, introduction. I have to say that was a very long time ago when I actually had a proper job uh, before I went into full-time uh, politics. I'm not sure I could go back to it now. It was 20 years. My experience is kind of 20 years uh, out of date. But... Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be uh, with you. Thank you to the KTN for hosting this uh, event. I know we're all here today to uh, hear about projects that have transformed the way that industrial sites consume uh, energy. And I want to thank all of the speakers that have uh, shared their experiences today uh, and provided an inspiration to other industrial sites who are starting their own journeys to net zero and looking for ways to cut uh, energy bills. From the ceramic cluster in the West Midlands to the Teesside chemical plants in my own home area of northeast uh, England, UK industry is obviously vitally important to our economy, contributing something like £180 billion each year, providing two and a half million direct jobs. And as the UK leads the race to net zero, we have to ensure that all businesses can be encouraged and can be supported to take uh, action. So this afternoon, I want to talk to you about what the government is doing to help industry to become more energy efficient. 
I know my officials work with many of your organisations to ensure that the government understands the challenges, the opportunities that are faced by all of those working to invest in cleaner technology whilst, of course, crucially remaining competitive at the same time. And this work is essential uh, and helps us to plan for the nation's net zero future. Underpinning uh, all of our work in this area is, of course, uh, you all know, the industrial decarbonisation strategy, the net zero strategy, both of which we published uh, last year. And they highlight the importance of energy efficiency in delivering the carbon savings that are vital to meet our legally binding carbon budgets over the next decade. An importance that uh, the government has re-emphasised today. I know you've probably been uh, sitting here close to it, so you won't have heard the Chancellor's uh, autumn uh, statement, but uh, he has announced the creation of a new energy efficiency task force charged with uh, accelerating progress on energy efficiency across the economy. Uh, and as the Minister for Energy Efficiency, that's something I welcome. I've been trying to persuade the Treasury of the importance of energy efficiency for a, a long time, so I'm delighted that we've been able to get this in. He also announced a new long-term commitment to drive improvements in energy efficiency to bring down bills for households, businesses and the public sector with an ambition, actually quite a challenging ambition, <coughs> excuse me, to reduce the UK's final energy consumption from buildings and industry by 15% by 2030 against 2021 levels. Um, £6 billion of new government funding will be made uh, available from 2025 to 2028, and that's in addition to the £6.6 .6 billion that's already been allocated this Parliament. <clears throat> and the idea of that is to provide long-term funding certainty, supporting the growth of the supply chain and ensuring that we can scale up our delivery over time. Now, the current energy bill crisis has, of course, meant that the incentive to invest in energy efficient technologies has never been greater. The cheapest energy, as you all know, is the energy that you don't use. Although higher energy prices create uh, what is a very strong incentive to invest, there are still numerous barriers that continue to leave significant energy efficiency opportunities untapped. Many businesses, particularly SMEs, lack the upfront capital to invest in energy efficiency measures and this has been uh, of course heightened by wider inflation and supply chain constraints so i'm delighted that the industrial energy transformation fund has been supporting industry with their energy efficiency and decarbonization plans investments in energy efficiency not only deliver uh, energy bill savings now but they also reduce the overall costs associated with transitioning the economy away from fossil fuels. And successful energy demand management also supports the resilience of our energy system and the, object, job, <coughs> the objectives that we outlined in the British Energy Security Strategy. So in these strategies, we recognise that, of course, there are different industrial processes that will require different, often bespoke solutions to deliver the required energy savings. And they set out how we are very willing to explore different options for encouraging the innovation and uptake of these uh, solutions. So funding opportunities, as we have, such as the Industrial Energy Efficiency Accelerator, have helped to develop many of the solutions that we ultimately hope to see industry adopting at scale. Uh, whilst programmes like the IETF, of course, help to overcome some of the capital barriers that first movers might encounter. We know that another key barrier, particularly among SMEs, is that many businesses also lack the awareness of appropriate measures for their particular business, and they may also not know where to go to for independent uh, advice. So at the same time, we're also therefore exploring options to deliver an industrial energy advice service, specifically tailored to SMEs, offering smaller businesses trusted advice on improving energy efficiency and decarbonisation, thereby helping them to reduce uh, their energy use, their costs, and to decarbonise. Bayes is also sponsoring uh, 100,000 free copies of the BSI ISO 5005 Energy Management Standard that supports SMEs on energy management. And that S ISO standard provides SMEs with the means to develop practical, low-cost approach to energy management to reduce their consumption, reduce their bills, and, of course, uh, their emissions. 
And we should also, I think, pause to recognise some of the great progress that industry has already made in delivering emissions and energy savings. Industry emissions have more than halved since 1990, uh, reflecting changes in manufacturing, in reflecting, of course, improved energy efficiency, and also the country's long-term shift towards low-carbon fuels. And to keep industry on that uh, journey to net zero, to meet our carbon budgets, uh, the NDCs that we uh, agreed under the Paris uh, Climate Change Agreement, we expect that emissions need to fall by a further two-thirds from today's levels by 2035, which is a tremendous challenge for us all. But acting now presents a huge opportunity to build back better uh, and greener following the pandemic. Speeding up the deployment of energy efficiency measures can provide a major economic stimulus, creating new highly skilled jobs, products, markets and supply chains in the UK fit for our net zero future. And of course, I know that this is a, delivering this is an aim shared by many people here in the room today. And I certainly look forward to, to working together with all of you to help you to achieve uh, our joint goals. So I hope I've been able to give you at least some insight into the opportunities ahead. And I very much look forward to hearing about the discussion that is uh, going to be generated, I know, from the next panel session. But I've also got some, uh, some time available and happy to answer any of your questions. So thank you very much indeed for listening. Please. Okay, well, thanks very much for that. We're going to now move on to our panel discussion on industrial energy efficiency. So I'd like to invite our panelists to come and join me on the stage. Ray's going to bring an extra chair. So if you would like to come and take a seat. Yeah, just pop one there. That's great. Great, so I'll just introduce our panel to you. Um, at the far end, we have a Nazarene Fielding from Bayes. Uh, Nazarene is Head of Industrial Energy Efficiency at Bayes and is an expert on the, all the policy in that area. Um, next, we have uh, Tim Shire, who is the Energy Manager at SRUK, one of the recipients of IETF funding in the summer of 2020, I think. Um, then we have Catherine James, who's the Public Affairs and Sustainability Advisor at Rockwall, and they were also successfully funded by the IETF. Uh, next up, we have Sebastian Van Dort, who is the Associate Director for Energy and Sustainability at the BSI. And last but not least, we have Manu Ravishka. Ravish, I'm so sorry, Manu. Uh, Ravishankar, who is the Innovation Lead for Ofgem Strategic Innovation Fund at Innovate UK. So the question for the panel today is all around uh, industrial energy efficiency. The case for investment in energy efficiency measures at the moment, it's just never been stronger. So the question I put to the panellists was, what can industry do to become more energy efficient and how can government support them? So I've asked each of our panellists to give a, a five minute overview, give their opinion and their views on that question, and then we'll open it up to the audience for questions, or if you'd like to make a comment as well, that would be fine. So start with Nazarene, please. Oh, Nazarene, sorry, you need a microphone. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm going to follow on from Lord Callaghan, and he's mentioned quite a lot already, but um, some of the key things, um, we know that energy efficiency has the potential to contribute to at least four megatons of carbon um, dioxide abatement in industry alone by 2050, probably more than that really. Um, as Lord Callan said, it's essential to achieving net zero on the pathway and it uh, leaves, um, it also reduces the cost of overall decarbonisation on big projects, government spend projects like carbon capture storage and hydrogen. But we are aware that companies are facing huge challenges at the moment due to um, COVID recovery, inflation, supply chains, and don't necessarily have lots of spare cash, even though they'd like to, to spend on energy efficiency. Um, it, it is obviously a no-brainer. It saves you money, helps you um, spend money on other things, and helps you on growth. And we know that many large energy users have a really good idea of their energy use. 
Uh, many of you have legal obligations under the UK ETS or ESOS reporting, um, but also you have energy managers, who, so you'll have a good understanding of your energy use. In terms of what industry can do, um, as Lord Callan has mentioned, download the free um, standard, which is available for SMEs. It's 50,005, and it's on the BSI website. Apply to the IETF. It's closing in January, but it's really important. Um, do you really understand your energy use? Uh, make sure you have smart meters and sub-meters installed for all of your processes. Um, probably obvious, but have you thought about your building's measures? Uh, they're simple measures, but have you uh, looked at things like your lighting, uh, ventilation systems, and looked at operational maintenance of those? A lot of that can actually uh, create a lot of efficiency by just servicing key equipment. Um, in terms of what's government role, well, um, we know that there are lots in industry who've come to us and said they don't know where to start, particularly smaller firms. And so, um, and they also don't have the access to finance. So one of the things we are doing, which was announced in the British Energy Security Strategy earlier in the year, was um, looking at the role of the Energy Advice Service and how we can uh, develop that. And there'll be more on that over the coming months. Um, look at tax incentives. There's the annual investment allowance. Uh, there is a super deduction uh, for buildings. There's the structures and buildings allowance. And also sign up to the climate change agreements, which gives you a discount on your climate change levy. Um, I've been talking to people here today who've talked about very short-term projects, less than a year. Uh, have a look at loans there. There is the uh, the recovery loan scheme, which allows you can also apply for energy efficiency under that. Um, and uh, also, but most importantly, we'd really welcome views from all of you in the audience. You understand this a lot better than we do. We want to understand what is our role, how can we help, but recognising there are constraints at the moment on government budgets. So what can we do? Is that advice? Is it pointing you into the right, to making those right connections? But we'd welcome ideas from others here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nazreen. And hand it over to Tim Shire from SR. Thank you. Um, so uh, there are a, a huge number of different ways that we can become more energy efficient and decarbonize. Um, and I think there's, there's all these routes, but they kind of all end up traversing the same road. And uh, I, I think that road's got a bit of a traffic jam on it. So just by way of example, some of the top few things we're doing. Um, my biggest number one energy saving is replacing inefficient steam turbines with electric motors. I do need a lot of electricity to do that. The, ne the next one on the list is um, heat recovery using a large-scale heat pump, probably 30 megawatt heat pump. Um, but I need some electricity to do that. Uh, we're looking at hydrogen fuel switching, building a hydrogen plant to convert our waste products into fuel, uh, into hydrogen with carbon capture. That needs an awful lot of electricity, even though it's blue hydrogen. Green would be even more. Um, and we're looking at carbon capture. And that needs a lot of heat and a lot of electricity. There's a pattern forming here. Now, the obvious answer then is um, CHP, distributed generation. And you know, CHP is beneficial to us. It, it would reduce our costs. Um, and it's also highly beneficial to the grid. So uh, you know, distributed, medium scale um, power generation at the point of demand you know, is really fundamentally helpful for the grid. However, if I want to develop a CHP, I, I'm, I'm kind of beholden to the, the DNOs, the, the distribution network operators, and the national grid. E even though I'm generating my own power, and I'm not really using much power off the grid. They have to make reinforcements to allow that project to take place. And it's kind of like a, a blank check. You, you make your application. They can charge whatever they want. They can tell you, quote you a timeline that's as long as they want. Um, and, you know, there's no incentives, really, for them. They're, they're a bit under-resourced on, on doing all this stuff. There's no carrot or stick for them to come up with a smarter, cheaper answer, to do it quicker, to deliver it on time. And, and it's a horrendous kind of external risk that we can't control, um, you know, both in time and money. And so... If there's one policy thing you could do, um, sort of, I don't know what I'll tell you what the problem is. I don't know what the answer is, but 
that, that's a real, real challenge, and it's a real threat. And, you know, again, from our perspective, we only shut our plant down once every four years. 2026, I want to do some major work, you know, some of this electrification stuff. If I can't get the power by then, I'm going to have to wait another four years to do it. it, it it's very uh, worrying. Mm. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so that, that would be the, the, the main thing. Uh, and, I, and I think, you know, the, the future state I, I, I'd, I'd like to see is, you know, industry with dispatchable power generation, able to support ourselves and export. When the wind turbines are blowing, we can turn that off and we can, uh, you know, use the decarbonized power. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, you know, I think we have a, a real positive place to, to help here. Um, uh, but, yeah, and, and therefore, please, could you prioritise us <laughs> in the DNOs and, uh, and the national grid infrastructure? No, I couldn't agree more, Tim. Um, now, moving on to uh, Catherine James from Rockwell. Hi. So, um, Rockwell are manufacturers of stormwater insulation products. So obviously, we you know, uh, provide quite an important product to the decolonisation of buildings and, and industry. Um, and despite being an energy intensive process, our products will save in a building um, 100 times more energy than was used to produce them. In industry, the ratios are far higher and payback can be in a matter of hours rather than sort of weeks and months. Um, nonetheless, that doesn't let us off the hook um, in trying to improve the energy efficiency and the, and the, the sort of carbon um, intensity of our processes. So we uh, put a bid in the, well, put three bids in the first phase of IETF, su successful on one, which is um, uh, generating electricity through uh, low-grade waste heat from using an ORC system. And we're looking at possibly putting in a bid through phase three now for a feasibility study on deep decarbonisation. <coughs> I think um, decarbonisation and energy use there's not that kind of linear relationship. I think energy use will go up as we decarbonize, as the electrification of industry, transport, and buildings. Um, so, you know, not only do we need to sort of replace the current sort of fossil fuel generation of electricity, we also need to increase the amount of electricity that's being produced overall. Um, and that, you know, needs to be coming from green sources. So I think energy efficiency is, is, you know, an important tool in reducing the amount of investment that's going to be required to uh, sort of decarbonise the energy system um, as we, you know, as our sort of demand increases over time. Um, with regards to the IETF specifically, I think one of the challenges that we've faced is that we, we're a global company and there's 40 manufacturing sites across the world. We're competing with each of those to get investment from our group. So while IETF provides a really important sort of source of funding that we can pull down and show to the group and say, look at this, you know, it's much cheaper to invest here than elsewhere because we've got this, this bit of seed funding and that brings investment into the UK. The timelines aren't quite right for these sort of major capital projects. So, you know, electrification of our process, for example, would, re you know, it would result in an 80% reduction in our carbon emissions. It's really, really significant savings. Um, but the kind of decision making for that kind of capital project is over years, it's not mm. over months. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of the, the, the timing is a little bit too rapid, I think, in terms of how the, the scheme is currently structured. Um, so very interested in sort of future phases about how we have that conversation um, about, you know, how, how, how the scheme can fit in with business decision making timetables, making sure that we can get the maximum benefit from, from these schemes. So you would also be interested in an extension to the ITF? Then? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on now to Sebastian Van Dort from BSI. Hi everyone, I'm Sebastian from the BSI. We are the uh, UK's national standards body and we help um, UK government and industry with standardisation needs and we have a lot of big standardisation programmes related to this, so in hydrogen, batteries, energy smart appliances to drive energy flexibility. Uh, and we believe that um, one big component to the net zero transitions are standards. Um, we believe that with um, all this new generation coming on board that um, uh, all these systems need to be interoperable and you need the sort of standards there. In order to reach net zero, we need unprecedented levels of innovation. And obviously, um, once you want to mainstream innovation, there is a big element of standardization. We believe that, that we can help there. Finally, we, we need sort of rigor and credibility in, in a number of areas to avoid uh, greenwashing, but also to make um, consumer choices easier for, uh, you know, if they choose products, that they're low carbon products, but have that rigor in there. 
energy efficiency in, in this whole sort of systems of system thinking is, is very important. I think, as Lord Cullinan pointed out, the, the greenest energy is the one that you sort of don't use. So it is very important. I think it's uh, important to point out that energy efficiency is doing exactly the same thing, but with less energy. So in, in, in that sense, it makes a lot of sense. It has a number of benefits from you know, emissions reductions to cost reductions, but also uh, wider benefits to the system. So the case for energy efficiency is sort of very strong. I'm very pleased that ISO 50005, that base, kindly sponsored and, and you know, was mentioned earlier, that it's freely available. And I believe that as a big, um, um, from a standards point of view, management systems uh, provide a guided way to, to reduce your emissions. So I think that's a great thing. I think you know, what we need from a government uh, point of view or from, from a policy point of view um, I think a lot has been done in, in, in fairness, you know, net zero strategy, hydrogen strategy, energy security strategy that, you know, they lay out a sort of clear path. But we do need, um, you know, a long term policy framework that we can build on. I think that's key and, and a bit of a roadmap. Um, I think, you know, there's probably also a challenge for us, clearer guidance for, um, um, for industry. And again, as the national standards body, we, we, we can help there. Um, and then data transparency, I think, is a big sort of element uh, in this. So um, those are my sort of Thank easy you very much, Sebastian. Moving on to Manu. Thank you. Um, so uh, thanks for having me, first of all. Um, so I work for the Strategic Innovation Fund. Uh, we are a 450 million pound um, energy network innovation fund delivered by Innovate UK uh, for Ofjam. Um, it is mainly to help gas and electricity networks transition to net zero at the lowest cost. I was going to start my five minute spiel with um, talking about the need for energy system innovation, but I think Tim has done it much better than I could have unplanned. Uh, and so I think that he's set it out you know, beautifully in terms of why we need to work together between the energy networks and industries uh, and their journey towards decarbonization and why um, you know, carrots and sticks. The innovation fund is the carrot in this phase. So, um, so I'm not going to repeat that message. I think he's done it better than I, I, I could have. So uh, just in terms of quick context, is that the energy networks are undergoing a significant transition. You know, you've got two sides of the energy system, the supply side and the demand side, changing significantly in response to net zero. You know, we're, we're having a lot more intermittent generation. We're having a lot more distributed generation. The shape of the demand is changing with greater use of electrification, with green fuels. And you've got the networks in between who have to take all of that energy and deliver it securely, robustly, when you need it. And so they're, you know, right, they're kind of backbone of the energy system and they're changing and they need to change very quickly. And it's a very conservative industry. You know, that's been there for the last you know, 120 years, really. So, and, and they're really changing faster than they have in the last 100 years of their existence. So there's a lot kind of going on in the energy network side. Um, so I guess to, to, in response to the, the question for this five minutes, energy efficiency, of course, is a no-regret option. And I think, as, as Lord Callan said, there's no better time to do kind of energy efficiency given the current market conditions of high energy price. But I think going beyond uh, using less energy, I think we need to complement it with um, smart and flexible energy system. I think that's, that's kind of the, the key point that I would want to make through here, is that uh, it's, it's not only about kind of using less energy, but it's using energy at the right time, uh, also will create a lot of system opportunities and cost savings for stakeholders such as um, industrial energy users. Um, I think research and modeling shows that if we you know, have a smart and energy system, we can reach our net zero goals um, cheaper between nine and 16 billion pounds per year. So it's certainly, a, the size of the price is kind of worth pursuing in terms of doing, doing that. Um, and talking about specifics now, you know, when you do electrification, there's significant opportunities to, to decouple. That's, that's the core of this. If you can split the production of energy with the use of energy by integrating technologies, then you create a lot of system benefits. So for example, if you introduce uh, energy storage systems or electricity storage systems, you kind of break the link between when uh, you can import power or create power and when you use power. Because if you kind of break that instantaneous link, that's what sets the marginal cost for uh, infrastructure investment in the energy system. So actually, if you do that, you can unlock a lot of savings uh, across the energy system. And also, there's been a lot of advancements. I think there were some questions on interseasonal storage, et cetera. I think there's been a lot of advancements in thermal energy storage, particularly making them uh, smaller, more energy dense, but also capable of handling higher temperature ranges. So again, there's a big opportunity there to decouple when you create the heat and when you use the heat. And again, a lot of that has uh, uh, system benefits. The point here is that uh, I think by going through this kind of smart and energy system transition, the industrial sector can better integrate with this transition that's happening uh, across the energy sector. So it not only kind of offers an opportunity to reduce cost by using energy when it's cheapest, 
but actually it opens up loads of revenue opportunities. Because what we're really moving towards in a smart energy system is one where system services are very valuable. You know, we're already spending billions of pounds a year on system services, and that's only set to increase. So what you're creating is a whole new revenue stream and opportunity for, for, for industrial consumers. And from a SIF perspective, you know, we're supporting uh, loads of these technologies. We're supporting interseasonal inter energy storage development. We're supporting projects where you can use uh, otherwise curtailed energy to turn it into hydrogen that can get used in other sectors uh, for their own decarbonization journeys. So I guess my call to action really is, um, you know, we really call out to, to industrial partners to, to kind of collaborate between yourselves, but also reach out to communities working close to you and come work with the energy networks through the SIF, and hopefully we can support a lot of exciting projects going forward. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Manu. So do we have any questions or comments um, from anybody in the audience? Any questions for the panelists? But if you have a comment, anything you'd like to share, the chap over there. Hi, Tom Graham from Bedrock Geothermal. As a question for Manu, really, it's just to what extent are heat networks part of that SIF program and the future energy uh, design? Thank you. Uh, yeah, heat networks are part. So actually, we've launched our um, challenges for next year, and the round is, is, is open. And heat networks are a part. So we've named heat networks as something that we want to see innovations around. Specifically, what we want to see is, I think, again, research shows that we need a lot of thermal energy. I think we need 300 terawatt hours of thermal energy uh, to kind of meet the renewable energy targets. Um, and the cheapest form of thermal energy storage is probably going to come from heat networks. But at the moment, we have no heat networks functioning in the UK that is providing any system services because there's no incentive to do it. They've not innovated around what control systems they need to change, why they need to integrate. And on the margin, they're not going to invest in these systems. It's not, so that's not going to give them a return. So that's exactly where we want to focus innovation on is how um, heating networks can become providers of system services. Uh, and, and hopefully we'll get, uh, I think we've, we are going to get a few applications on that, so happy to keep you in the loop. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question for Nazreen, if you'd like to pass the mic along. So um, I guess it would be, um, can you expand on some of the support, the, the listed a whole range of tax incentives and funding, and you mentioned the energy advice service, is there any more you could expand on that? Um, so the Energy Advice Service was announced in the British Energy Security Strategy, I think it was in April, um, and it's specifically for industrial SMEs. Um, I think it's fair to say that we are considering the role of the Energy Advice Service in light of current energy bills mm. and, and what we can do more generally for is industry and businesses. So uh, we'd welcome ideas on what it might usefully do. It is actively in development, but we're still very much in early stages. So, I mean, could it, for instance, help... Uh, manufacturers to understand what technologies are out there that might help them with their energy efficiency and that type I of thing. I think we'd be really keen to understand what Anything. others would like yeah, as well. Okay. So uh, any any requests or, um, you know, please let us know. Okay, thanks very Thank much. You. Any other questions? Yes, at the back. A question for uh, Tim actually. Um, you mentioned Tim earlier on uh, there are about four or five things that you'd like to do on site by 2026 um, and you highlighted that you know there are a number of issues associated with the grid that would prevent you doing that at the moment with either current grid mechanism or restrictions on you know how that is uh, sort of set up. Can you just talk a little bit more about um, what exactly those restrictions are and you said that you didn't have a solution, but if you could wave your crystal ball, what would you like to see? Okay, yeah. So, um, so I, uh, forgive me if I say something wrong on the electrical side, because I'm, I'm a process engineer. Um, so at a simplistic level, um, my uh, sort of ideal solution is I'll generate very efficient decarbonized power in my new hydrogen-powered CHP, and then I'll use that power to electrify stuff, which is much, much more efficient overall in terms of total fuel consumption than, than using fuel to make steam for, for the heat pump or, or the drives. And so you know, the big picture is I'm going to import a lot less power off the grid. I'm going to use more power in total, but I'll generate it myself. I'll avoid the grid distribution charges. Um, 
and I'll have a higher efficiency than that marginal combined cycle power plant. I'm not paying for carbon emissions like that marginal combined cycle power plant. So I'll, I'll get that cheap electricity and uh, it, it'll save me a load of money. And, and if you just look at it in an energy balance perspective, I'm not normally actually taking much off the grid. Um, so why is there a problem? Um, and, and then when you get into a little bit more detail, it, it comes down to the sort of the fault cases and the, the unusual situations. So um, I'll probably have some redundancy in my power generation, um, but I can monetize that redundancy by exporting when it makes sense to do so. Um, but equally, if, I, if I'm doing some maintenance and I have another failure, then um, I'll probably want to import off the grid. It's not worth me building yet more assets that are hardly ever going to run. I'll, I'll just, just buy some power for those, those events. But there's, a, there's another factor which, again, I'm, I might get this wrong because I'm not an electrical engineer, but the, the fault cases mean even if I'm not using any power, I, I'm, I'm just using it locally, generating it locally, pretty much zero is coming across my grid connection. The, the, my understanding is, if there's a fault out on the grid somewhere else, under certain circumstances, the grid will suck out, you know, just instantaneously for, for a fraction of a second, um, an awful lot of energy. So that the kinetic energy of the motors that are, that are the drives that are on turbines will generate, the, the gas turbines will, will generate. And that fault case, because I'm now electrified, is, is is worse than it was before, and so there's this instantaneous load on the network that it can't do today. So what we're, what we're asking the DNOs to do is to invest all this money in reinforcing the network to cope with these like, unusual trip cases. You know, normally there's no power demand from me anymore because I've got my CHP. So they have to spend a ton of money. They're not going to get any revenue from selling power to me because I'm going to self-generate, but they spend this money so that in these obscure, adverse, maybe improbable, maybe probable, I don't know, cases, that everything's robust. So, so that's the, technically why something's needed. Um, and then the process by which you apply is you, you design your system um, and you make an application and you say, well, I'd like to build this. Uh, they do a study and they come back with a kind of take it or leave it offer. You know, this will cost you... 20 million, 50 million, who knows? And it'll take us five years or whatever it is. And, and you don't really have, maybe, maybe they could have done something smarter. Maybe the site next door is also electrifying and you could combine forces. Because it, it's a very strict, um, you join the queue. Hmm. Um, if you're lucky, there's enough capacity and you get it cheap and quick. If you suddenly tip over, ah, this whole bit of network's no longer got enough capacity. You have to pay for a massive amount of reinforcement, um, and then the next person gets it free again because they, they've, they've done this step. Um, so I, I think there's an issue with prioritization, which projects should get to the top of the list, and uh, you know, obviously I'm biased, but I think for the reasons we said above, you know, it, no offense to data centers, right? A data center is just an energy demand it's just loading up the grid, whereas an industrial CHP is loading up the grid, but also it's providing these services which help. So maybe there should be some different prioritization. And then the other thing is, well, what's the picture with all, all the different people? Can we share the costs more evenly? Um, yeah, so, so priority order is one thing. And then uh, the DNOs have a huge job on their hands, right? The, the, this transition is, is a huge challenge for them. So I, I'm, not, I'm not saying like they, they're lazy or they don't do anything. They, they do have a massive backlog of things that they need to do. But, you know, can they be incentivized to, to hire more people, to do these studies quicker, uh, you know, to be rewarded if they can actually... You, you know, I'm kind of thinking if, if they had targets for the number of connections that they have to create a year, the way they'd hit that target is by looking, oh, well, actually, there's, 
there's 10 people on the waiting list in this one area. I could do this one, and I could get all these people up, up to speed. So, so it would drive a bit of that efficiency. And mm. I, I don't know exactly, because I don't know how they're exactly reimbursed and what, what, what their incentives and penalties are. But prioritization and incentivization, I think, are the, the things needed there. I um, guess if we can pass back to Manu. So Manu, <laughs> just to put you on the spot now, if all of our industrial sites were generating their own energy and taking that pressure off the grid, um, can you see that as a, a good opportunity? And do you think the DNOs would be open to that type of... I mean, maybe it has already come up in the SIF programme. Yeah, it is. I mean, um, I think there's a few issues here. I think there's one is what the existing process of connection is and sharing of reinforcement costs. And, and there's a lot of programme of kind of work going on within Ofgem on that. And the second is... How do you best coordinate when you know you have industrial sites, commercial sites, homes, areas all doing their decarbonization journeys? How do you actually pull all of that together into a workable energy system that's cost effective? And I know there's a lot of work going on around things like you know cluster development, but local area energy planning. But yeah, it's still in the kind of early stage where they're trying to still figuring out what the right sequencing events are, because what you don't want to do is to create unintended consequence of doing something and raising the energy bills for somebody else or the, you know. So all of this takes a little bit of time because you're trying to find not only a fast solution, but something that's equitable, that kind of works for everyone. But yeah, in theory, a system positive asset is, is great. Um, you know, if it kind of improves overall efficiency, it takes the pressure off the system, it allows you to decarbonize faster, uh, absolutely. And you know, happy to have a chat offline if there's any mm -hmm. kind of innovation opportunities there. Yeah. That was actually going to be my next question. So um, I think, for the government as well, um, how, this again coming back to the advice service maybe is another thing to add on to that, but how do we engage with industrial sites better? How can we make sure that you are aware of things that are going on in energy networks and, and opportunities or barriers, getting around the barriers that are stopping you from decarbonising faster? So uh, does any of the panel have any ideas on that? Um, I don't think I mentioned it in my talk, but I know you heard about it this morning from, from Owen about the South Wales Industrial Cluster, and I know that most of the uh, sort of regions of the UK have got their own kind of industrial clusters. Um, now, they're doing some amazing work, really, and, you know, my site's very different to Owen's, but we've got similar challenges, and, you know, all the industries across South Wales have got challenges that, you know, we're, we're all kind of uh, having common. So we're, we're looking at how can we work together to best overcome those, rather than each of us doing our own little bit of work, you know, and um, not sort of, you know, really making the opportunities um, to, to kind of leave our economy to scale. But what the clusters can also do, then, is provide, like, a point of contact into industry, so most of the big industrial players in South Wales are part of the South Wales Industrial Cluster. They'll be on the mailing list. They'll be engaging in the projects. So it's an easy way to sort of engage with all of the industries across South Wales rather than having to sort of, you know, um, attack them one at a time. Um, if, you know, if you're an industry and you're not yet in a cluster, it's definitely worth um, exploring to see uh, what opportunities you can get. Um, with South Wales, they've had a number of funded projects. Um, currently going through a bit of a bit of an evolution into a kind of legal entity, which will sort of increase their ability to to pull in these funding projects. But it's um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a really sort of good way of finding out what's going on in your area. How can you get involved with it? How can you sort of take opportunities? Um, you know, we're looking at things like carbon capture pipelines, uh, hydrogen supply, and sort of sharing those across sites rather than just you know sort of each sort of working on our own thing. And I think the South Wales just sorry. The, the South Wales example is a good one because we talk about clusters, but actually the South Wales cluster is the whole of the south coast of Wales, isn't it? Yes, it's it's yeah. very spread out. It's not that they all have to be in the same location. You're more that you're working together as a cluster, yes. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, Tim, do you want to go and then over to Seb? Just to add to that, and I think um, he's, what you're saying is great, that, that ability to collaborate and share knowledge and, and stuff. Uh, but I think there's sort of two levels of it. There's some stuff that works really well geographically, so hydrogen, carbon capture, um, ele electric electricity. Um, but there's other stuff that's probably better done at a sector level. Um, so you know, you come to events like this, and, and there's some very specific uh, learnings and great ideas that, that only apply to certain sectors. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't speak for other industry trade bodies, but the, the level of stuff from industry trade bodies we're in is pretty much uh, an email saying there's an ITF thing 
uh, forwarding it on? Are you interested? And, and I think there's probably a lot, of, lot more value. Um, I, I know some of the fuel switching they're doing in the Northeast cluster is, would, would be highly relevant to us. Mm -hmm. um, the kind of projects that we do, you, you know, they, they're specific to our industry. And, and so perhaps something to foster, um, yeah, sector specific sharing as yeah. well as geographic sharing would be useful. Yeah. I know that some of the trade associations are really good at that, but the, yeah, there's, there's probably... Yes, not, not to name names, but yeah, <laughs> I, I, I can accept that. Yeah. And said. Yeah, I was, I was just going to come in on that. Um, one of the reasons why I asked for um, policy roadmaps is a lot of the time we work sort of back from policy drivers and, and then you know, that's what, what we're going to deliver. So the hydrogen rollout is, is sort of one of those. So for me, what I'm trying to do with the standards programs that we do is really follow the policy landscape to say where do we need to be and create standards ahead of that. And a lot of the time we convene industry around things like you know, hydrogen use in aviation, in transport, uh, decarbonisation of heat. Uh, and really co you know, convene the community around that. And, and I think we sort of, sort of need more of that, and then we need that knowledge sharing, because even though we you know, do a lot of work in these areas, sometimes even in those areas it's quite siloed, and there's a lot mm -hmm. of lessons that you can learn, even from sort of different industries. So for me, it's like working back of what is the roadmap that we're trying to achieve here? What does the community of interest or industry look like? How do we bring all of those together? Mm -hmm. And from our point of view, um, you know, it's the National Standards Body was separate from government, separate from industry. So what we can then do is bring the experts together, get the problem statement, and then what we often do is look internationally, because a lot of times something has been figured out internationally mm -hmm. already, particularly from a standards point of view. But if there isn't, then we can you know, start here and mm -hmm. have a global sort of leadership position. So I think really bringing industries together around specific problem statements uh, and then sharing that knowledge is, uh, would be very useful, I think. Do you think the new task force might help with that? that yes, you mentioned? I, yes I, yeah. I, absolutely. And yeah, you know, I think the other thing that I'm sort of wondering and just sort of <laughs> wondering out loud now, that there's a lot of task forces. So how do we bring yeah. all of that together? And also how do we make the next step, right? There's a lot mm -hmm. of recommendations that come from a task force. Mm -hmm. How do we implement those? More action. Yes, yeah. yes. And I think, you know, there's a wider quality infrastructure like BSI, you guys, a number of other organisations that might be able to sort of help with the next step on, yeah. on that journey, really. Yeah. And Manu? Thanks. Yeah, for me, it's... Early engagement, I think. Um, I think some of the sectors, we probably know what the sequence of events are to decarbonize a certain industry sector. But for example, I was at a lecture a couple of days ago about how to decarbonize the ethylene sector, the chemical processing sector. And actually, they were laying out, actually, we just don't know. We have two or three options. And if, we, if you follow through that logic and actually see, this energy system implication of these three options are very, very different. Mm. So I think, um, you know, once you have a, a view or certain options, I think early engagement with um, you know, the DNO or system operator or the energy sector more broadly, I think will help to plug that into the wider energy system. And I think then you can see the costs and benefits of different solutions. And then new innovation opportunities open up. And then, you know, you can link with kind of other sequencing that's kind of going on around your sector. So I think early engagement as you kind of do your decarbonization journey, I think offers a lot of opportunity, not only for that site, but for the kind of wider system as well. Lovely. And I'd like to give the final word to Nazarene, if there was anything that you can ask from this audience that would help Bayes to support them, what would it be? Um, I think I would genuinely like to know about financing, what, what are the barriers to financing at this current time? I know many people here are from larger companies, so may have, but there they probably are access to finance issues and how can government help support you? And also on the sort of awareness of technologies and helping you on your energy efficiency journeys, what can we do to help you with that? Thanks. Thank you very much. So, a round of applause for our panellists. Thank you, guys. You can take your seats again. I'd like to hand over to Richard now, who's going to tell you about the Industrial Heat Recovery Support Programme. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Just a quick Just Gotcha. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. So, I'm Richard Nyer. I'm a managing consultant at ICF. Um, so, we've provided the uh, well, for Bayes, we delivered the Industrial Heat Recovery Support Programme um, all the way through from um, the application process through to completion of the projects. Um, and we're also currently providing the technical support services to the ITF um, for Bayes as well, um, for which I'm the project manager. So fairly quick presentation here today, actually talking about IHRS, so quick overview of the programme and talk about some of the achievements and then throw up some case studies hopefully inspire you to apply to the, the final round of ITF. So 
IHRS um, is a program looking at um, helping businesses to identify heat recovery opportunities, specifically on industrial sites in England and Wales, and then invest in deploying um, technologies um, to recover that heat. It had a pretty broad set of eligibility requirements. Um, so, you know, manufacturing SIT codes all the way from 10 to 33, so that's everything from fruit juice through to mattresses um, and metals and everything in between. Um, and it also covered data centers. Um, so it's almost a bit of a precursor to IETF, but specifically focused on heat recovery and reuse. Overall objectives, looking to increase industry confidence um, and drive some investment in heat recovery technologies. Um, and at the end of the day, increase deployment of heat recovery technologies across England and Wales. In terms of entry points, um, there were a number of different entry points to the program, um, depending on how mature the business's solution for heat recovery was at the time. So if a feasibility study uh, had already been com had, hadn't been completed yet, um, you could enter, get funding for a feasibility study um, with a grant of up to 50% of costs. If you did have a feasibility study and wanted to develop that further into a preliminary design, then again, a second entry point there uh, with up to 30% grant funding. Or if you had something off the shelf, then you could go directly to detailed design and project delivery. And you could also flow all the way through the process from a feasibility study to a deployment through the IHRS project uh, program. So looking at overall headlines, um, 31 projects were awarded funding, um, 18 studies, and 13 deployment projects. So what kind of impact has that had? So for studies, um, about 690,000 megawatt hours of energy savings identified, um, and then a potential for 79,000 megawatt hours of energy use on actual deployed projects. Um, and this is, these are annual numbers. Then looking at Cost savings, 6.6 .6 million identified through um, studies and feed studies um, with 1.4 million annual savings across deployment projects. And then in terms of actual tons of carbon dioxide savings, we're looking at around um, 63,000 tons of carbon dioxide for deployment projects um, and about 3 million tons of carbon dioxide identified for future <coughs> deployment through studies and feed. Um, and what's really exciting and what I get to see, having looked at IHRS and now working on ITF, is seeing some of those feed studies coming through for actual deployment in ITF. So in that respect, the IHRS has been really beneficial for businesses. Um, so some really exciting projects as well. So what kind of technologies are we seeing? Um, so a, a broad set of technologies that we've seen come through for funding. Um, so organic ranking cycles, looking to generate electricity from low temperature hot water there, I guess in the grand scheme of, of heat across industry. Um, thermal storage, so utilizing thermal storage, so recovering heat when it is being generated um, and then reusing it later on down the line. Um, so again, maybe that's something that ties into the um, grid picture um, and demand side management as well. Um, flue gas economizers was another, another good piece of technology. So recovering waste heat from flue gas, so from CHPs or boilers, um, so either for reheating product, reheating boiler feed water, or being used directly as process heat. Um, a number of heat pump systems as well. So again, just using that electrical input to boost low grade waste heat to, for process heating. Um, and then also, if there's a cooling demand that needs this currently not being met, or it's being met in less of an efficient way, um, absorption cooling as well. So taking heat, adding it into an absorption cooler um, to provide chilling to the process as well. And then also just waste heat boilers, um, so generating steam directly from process waste heat, whether that be in a gas or a, or a liquid stream. So a lot of really interesting technologies. Um, and again, we also see these coming through onto ITF as well. So just because IHRS is closed doesn't mean you can't do heat recovery programs anymore. So I've got a number of case studies coming up now that will hopefully pique your interest. Um, so the first one here is a deployment project, so Solution UK, so a medium-sized chemical manufacturing site based in South Wales. Um, what was their current setup? So previously, they had a combined heat and power plant, um, and they thought, cool, that's a, we're wasting heat there from the, from the flue gas. So they installed a condensing economizer 
on their flue gas, preheating boiler feed water, so reducing their fossil fuel requirement quite significantly. So looking at annual savings of around 1.1 megawatt hours of fuel input, saving around 1,400 tonnes of carbon dioxide in that per annum. So a good hard hitter there. Um, also has other benefits alongside the, the quantified benefits. So you're looking at it raised awareness of efficiency across the site. So talking about this project with their employees, with the site staff, kind of makes people on their site start thinking a bit more about energy efficiency. Um, and also the condensate from the process um, has been um, recovered and can be reused. Um, so I guess a picture that you'll see across a lot of these we've seen on, on a lot of these projects is the the funding has just enabled the return on investment to look a lot better make the project financially viable so you know maybe you've gone for a six-year payback where if you're competing again for funding across a large group maybe you're on the bottom of the list and then suddenly here you've got a three-year payback due to the funding um and you've met a new uh, payback threshold so a project that might happen later, is now happening sooner, so you're decarbonizing sooner, reducing your energy, improving your energy efficiency. So next case study, so here is a feed study, so basal polyolefins, um, site based in Carrington, up near Manchester. Um, so here they had, they, they were looking at an actual process stream, so you've got process vapor um, coming off one of their um, lines, and they wanted to understand the costs of reusing that um, to preheat some other, other feedstock. So recovery there, they were just rerouting this vapor through to a um, distillation column reboiler. Um, what's the impact? So throughout through the feed study, they developed a design and developed the costing um, and identified lots of risks and issues that they needed to be solved prior to deployment. Um, but some great annual saving potential there in terms of 17,000 megawatt hours uh, energy saving per annum, uh, three and a half thousand tons of carbon dioxide per annum. So some really, really good savings and, and quite a large percentage of, of site, site energy and carbon as well. Um, so again, you can see from the quote on the screen from from the company themselves as well. It's this kind of funding that just helps push these projects forward and accelerate them. So. Moving on to the next one. So this is an, an actual deployment deployment project. So Yo Valley, um, I'm sure you've seen their products on the shelves, um, organic dairy products manufactured down in Somerset. Um, so here is, it's a fairly straightforward, simple project. And it just illustrates how, in some cases, a relatively cheap project can provide a lot of benefit just using really simple off-the-shelf bits of equipment. So they had some air-cooled refrigeration condensers, um, and they replaced them. And all they did is the new units um, on their carbon dioxide refrigeration plant, um, it had a plate heat exchanger, so they just integrated that in, into their system to provide 65 degree process hot water. Um, and so it's fairly low budget, really simple, you're just plumbing in your bits of kit, um, but again, quite big savings. As you can see on the screen, nearly 1,000 megawatt hours per annum saved, um, a fair bit of fair few tons of carbon dioxide and quite a good annual saving. Um, and with the IHRS funding, um, managed to push that to a payback period of two years, making it a really viable product project for them. Um, so final case study. Um, so this was quite an interesting one, another deployment, this time at British Sugar. So not so much installing new heat recovery equipment, but a project to improve the efficiency of existing heat recovery equipment. So I think for, for those of you in industry who have fairly dirty processes, where maybe you've got a, a dirty liquid or gas stream and you know, you're worried about fouling, your heat exchanger is going to get fouled up, this is the same, same issue British Sugar were having. Um, so they had some plate heat exchangers um, and they were recovering heat from a waste condensate stream, but lots of fouling involved lots of manual maintenance, breaking open, open the heat exchangers to clean them. So what was funded here was a project to install a um, dedicated chemical cleaning system. So instead of having that reduction in heat transfer and reduction in efficiency, um, they were able to install this, regular cleaning, um, they were able to take an advantage of a four, an extra four and a half degree temperature rise consistently um, and reduce their boiler house fuel consumption. Um, and 
other benefits there. You know, you're not putting your operators at risk doing invasive manual maintenance work. Um, and again, fairly substantial annual savings in energy, um, carbon dioxide, and cost. Um, I think I quite like this project because it shows you, you know, outside of the box thinking as opposed to we need a heat exchanger, we need to recover heat. It's can you also improve the efficiency of your existing heat recovery systems that, that you've got on site? And what are the next steps? So IHRS is now closed, but IETF phase two is still open. Um, and there's lots of opportunities where you can go and get inspired. So all those case studies, um, I've taken those summaries from the IHRS webpage, um, which you can just Google and find. All of the phase one winners of IETF are uh, up there as well, so you can see what's going on in industry. Um, and then apply, you know. Heat recovery schemes still open in IETF uh, alongside so many other different energy efficiency and deep decarbonization, deep decarbonization options. Um, so yeah, please apply. And yeah, that's me, thank you. point um, on the slide you had you had a lot of money going to consultancy feasibility studies and relatively small amounts of money going to what I would call kind of implementation delivery is that what you want or would you like to shift it more towards delivery and if so do you need to structure it differently to do so so I guess looking at the ob overall objectives it was kind of the I guess the two parts of the scheme so there's the identification of opportunities as well as the deployment. I think, you know, looking at the overall objective at the end of the day it is to reduce energy consumption, reduce carbon emissions, so more deployment is always good. Um, but I think in terms of supporting businesses to understand where the opportunities are, I think that is a good success and we are seeing some of those projects now coming through to IETF as well for actual deployment. Um, so I think it, it is a necessary step for companies to identify their opportunities, um, but obviously we do want to see deployment of those opportunities where possible. And thanks very much, Richard. I was really interested when you said that actually doing one of the projects had sort of changed the behaviour of some of the people working on the site. Is that something that you've seen a lot? That the fact that you're kind of getting involved, you're starting the development of a application development of a technology do you see that changing some of the behavior that there might be in terms of energy consumption um, I guess in terms of IHRS um, I guess the, the the data points we have are the kind of the feedback that we get through the case studies and it does crop up on a few of them as well um, I would say as well through the IHRS and IETF as well there's the whole development of monitoring and verification plans and I think that's kind of a a soft benefit in kind of upskilling sites in thinking about energy use in a, in a slightly different way and being more aware of it. So I think that's a, a softer benefit as well. Just to follow up to the earlier question, do you see any evidence or, or anecdotes that after having completed all of those studies, um, companies are either deciding not to progress with deployment at all, putting it in the too hard basket, or that they're deciding to progress with deployment outside IETF or IHRS? I think that's a great question, but I don't, I don't have an answer, to be honest. I don't have that data to hand, but Fair definitely enough. something to look at. Okay, so we've come to the end of today's event. I just wanted to thank you all very much for attending uh, today's event. Hope you found it useful, got some ideas of things that you could do on your site with support from the IETF uh, fund that is, as Lily said earlier on, open until the 13th of January. And if I have my way, 
more to come. Um, you will get a link to the recording and also um, a link to the slides that have been presented today, so you can watch those again. Um, we also will send you a link to the slides that have been going around on the networking wall so that you can uh, connect with those people that have offered uh, their services up. Um, we're also going to ask you on the thank you email if you could opt in or opt out on sharing your um, details, not your email or your telephone number, but just your name for GDPR reasons. We wanted to be able to share a delegate list um, and forgot to put that tick box on the registration site. So we're going to send it around in the thank you email and then we'll be able to share the delegate list for everybody that's happy to, to say they were here. Um, and also you will get uh, a link to the IETF competition so uh, you know where to go on Bayes' portal to be able to apply into the, to the fund as well. Um, so if you are staying for one-to-ones with the industrial sites, they're going to be taking place in here. But everybody else, um, you're welcome to stay. That We're going to be here at least till four o'clock, help yourself to tea and coffee and carry on the networking out in the catering area. Um, but thank you all very much again for, for joining us today. Thank you.